Section one of the Art of Worldly Wisdom. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. The Art of Worldly Wisdom by Balthazar Gassian. Translated by Joseph Jacobs. Section one. To Mrs. G. H. Lewis. Dear Mrs. Lewis, this little book were not worthy of being associated with your name did it not offer an ideal of life at once refined and practical cultured yet wisely energetic gracian points to noble aims and proposes on the whole no ignoble means of attaining to them the spanish jesuit sees clear but he looks upward there is however one side of life to which he is entirely blind as was perhaps natural in an ecclesiastic writing before the age of salons he nowhere makes mention in his pages of the gracious influence of woman as inspirer and consoler in the battle of life permit me to repair this omission by placing your name in the forefront of this english version of his maxims to those honoured with your friendship this will by itself suffice to recall all the ennobling associations connected with your sex believe me dear mrs lewis your most sincerely joseph jacobs kilburn twenty sixth of october eighteen ninety two preface my attention was first drawn to the oraculo manual by mr now sir montstuart grant duff's admirable article on balthazar gracian in the fortnightly review of march eighteen seventy seven i soon after obtained a copy of schopenhauer's excellent version and during a journey in spain i procured with some difficulty a villainously printed edition of gracian's work barcelona seventeen thirty four poor joseph girald which contains the oraculo manual towards the end of the first volume pages four hundred thirty one to four hundred ninety four i have translated from this last referring in the many doubtful places of its text to the first madrid edition of sixteen fifty three the earliest in the british museum i have throughout had schopenhauer's version by my side and have found it as sir mon stuart grant duff says a most finished piece of work though i have pointed out in the notes a few cases where he has failed in my opinion to give gracian's meaning completely or correctly i have little doubt that i am a fellow sinner in this regard i know no prose style that offers such difficulty to a translator as gracian's laconic and artificial epigrams it is not without reason that he has been called the introducible the two earlier english versions miss his points time after time and i found it useless to refer to them on the other hand i have ventured to adopt some of sir mount stuart grant duff's often very happy renderings in the extracts contained in his fortnightly article i have endeavoured to reproduce gracian's laconism and cultismo in my version and have even tried to retain his many paronomasias and jingles of similar sound i may have here and there introduced others of my own to redress the balance for cases where i found it impossible to produce the same effect in english in such cases i generally give the original in the notes wherever possible i have replaced spanish proverbs and proverbial phrases by english ones and have throughout tried to preserve the characteristic rhythm and brevity of the proverb in short if i may venture to say so i have approached my task rather in the spirit of fitzgerald than of bourne the gem on the title representing a votive offering to hermes the god of worldly wisdom is from a fine paste in the british museum of the best period of greek glyptic art i have to thank mr cecil smith of that institution for kind advice in the selection let me conclude these prefatory words with a piece of advice as oracular as my original when reading this little book for the first time read only fifty maxims and then stop for the day joseph jacobs testimonia il est si concis si rompu et si étrangement coupé qu'il semble qu'il ait pris l'obscurité à tâche aussi le lecteur a besoin d'en deviner le sens et souvent quand il a compris il trouve qu'il s'est étudié à faire une énigme d'une chose fort commune f van arsens voyage d'espagne 1667 
page 294 il a beaucoup d'élévation de subtilité de force et même de bon sens mais on ne sait le plus souvent ce qu'il veut dire et il ne le sait pas peut-être lui-même quelques-uns de ses ouvrages ne semblent être faits que pour n'être point entendus bourrours entretien d'artistes et de gênes sixteen seventy one page two hundred and three louisa de padilla a lady of great learning and countess of aranda was in like manner angry with the famous gracian upon his publishing his treatise of the discreto wherein she fancied that he had laid open those maxims to common readers which ought only to be reserved for the knowledge of the great these objections are thought by many of so much weight that they often defend the above-mentioned authors by affirming they have affected such an obscurity in their style and manner of writing that though every one may read their works there will be but very few who can comprehend their meaning the spectator number three hundred seventy nine seventeen twelve en cherchant toujours l'énergie et le sublime il devient tout trait et se perd dans les mots gracian est au bon moraliste ce que don quichotte est au vrai héros ils ont l'un et l'autre un faux air de grandeur qui en impose aux sots et qui fait rire les sages abbé de fontaine seventeen forty five elogios no se deben al autor del criticon en medio de las antitesis paranomasias y toda la metralla culta es una de las obras más recomendables de nuestra literatura por la felicidad de la invención la inagotable riqueza de imaginación y de sales por la viveza de sus pinturas y por la gracia soltura y naturalidad del estilo don manuel silvela biblioteca selecta de literatura española 1819 si hubiese gracián procedido con más sobriedad en el uso de estos juegos y conceptos cuál es el escritor de su tiempo de tantos dotes y caudal nativo para ser el más fecundo y elegante sabiendo como lo manifesto en dónde estaban las delicatezas y los donaires esto es lo amargo lo dulce lo picante lo salado de la lengua castellana don antonio Camani, teatro de la elocuencia española tomo cinco the oraculo manual has been more used than any other of the author's works it is intended to be a collection of maxims of general utility but it exhibits good and bad precepts sound judgments and refined sophisms all confounded together in this work gracian has not forgotten to inculcate his practical principles of jesuitism to be all things to all men hacerse a todos nor to recommend his favorite maxim to be common in nothing en nada vulgar which in order to be valid would require a totally different interpretation from that which he has given it Bauterich. the person however who settled the character of cultismo and in some respects gave it an air of philosophical pretension was balthazar gracian a jesuit of aragon who lived between sixteen o one and sixteen fifty eight exactly the period when the cultivated style took possession of spanish prose and rose to its greatest consideration g ticknor history of spanish literature three two hundred and twenty two dabei ist es das einzige seiner art und nie ein anderes über denselben gegenstand geschrieben worden denn nur ein individuum aus der feinsten aller nationen der spanischen konnte es versuchen dasselbe lehrt die kunst derer alle sich befließigen und ist daher für jedermann besonders aber ist es geeignet das handbuch aller derer zu werden die in der großen welt leben ganz vorzüglich aber junger leute die ihr glück darin zu machen bemüht sind und denen es mit einem mal und zum voraus die belehrung gibt die sie sonst erst durch lange erfahrung erhalten a schopenhauer literarische notiz vor seiner übersetzung 1831, published 1861 avec beaucoup d'esprit d'instruction et de facilité il n'a rien produit qui puisse aujourd'hui soutenir l'examen de la critique la plus impartiale puis busque histoire comparée des littératures espagnoles et françaises eighteen forty three one page five hundred and fifty nine gracian aurait pu être un excellent écrivain 
s'il n'avait pas voulu devenir un écrivain extraordinaire doué d'une vaste érudition d'un esprit fin d'un talent profond d'observation il était né pour éclairer son siècle mais la vanité de devenir novateur corrompit son goût en le portant à introduire dans la prose ce langage précieux ces expressions alambiquées que gongora avait introduit dans les vers a de Bacca, bibliothèque des écrivains de la compagnie de jésus 1869 s v Gracian. Así como las máximas de Antonio Pérez fueron muy populares entre cortesanos o doctos o ilustrados, así españoles como extranjeros, por aquella delicadeza especial de estilo, las del padre Baltasar Gracián alcanzaron la misma estima por ese atildamiento en el decir, atildamiento que tenía en sí un inexplicable atractivo y que aunque algo participaba del general culteranismo de la literatura española en aquel siglo encerraba cierto buen gusto deslumbrador y lisonjero para el lector que se profundísimos conceptos preciaba con la fuerza de su ingenio acuelos don adolfo de castro obras escogidas de filosofía 1873, page 108 taking the book as a guide especially for those who intend to enter public life i have never chanced to meet with anything which seemed to me even distantly to approach it it would possibly be rather difficult to disprove the thesis that the spanish nation has produced the best maxims of practical wisdom the best proverb the best epitaph and the best motto in the world if i had to sustain it i would point with reference to the first head to the oraculo manuel sir m e grant duff on balthazar gracian in fortnightly review march eighteen seventy seven some have found light in the sayings of balthazar gracian a spaniard who flourished at the end of the seventeenth century i do not myself find gracian much of a companion though some of his aphorisms give a neat turn to a commonplace j morley on aphorisms studies eighteen ninety one page eighty six End of section 1We may certainly say of Gracian what Heine, by an amiable fiction, said of himself. He was one of the first men of his century. For he was born on the 8th of January, 1601, N.S. at Belmont, a suburb of Calatayud, in the kingdom of Aragon. Calatayud, properly Calat Ayub, Job's town, is nearly on the site of the ancient Bilbilis, Martial's birthplace. As its name indicates, it was one of the Moorish settlements, and nearly one of the most northern. By Gracian's time, it had again been Christian and Spanish for many generations, and Gracian himself was of noble birth. For a Spaniard of noble birth, only two careers were open, arms and the church. In the seventeenth century, arms had yielded to the cassock, and Balthazar and his three brothers all took orders. Felipe, his eldest, joined the order of St. Francis. The next brother, Pedro, became a Trinitarian during his short life, and a third, Raimundo, became a Carmelite. Balthazar himself tells us, Agudeza, chapter 25, that he was brought up in the house of his uncle, the licentiate Antonio Gracian, at Toledo, from which we may gather that both his father and his mother, a Morales, died in his early youth. He joined the company of Jesus in 1619, when in its most flourishing state, after the organizing genius of Aquaviva had given solid form to the bold counterstroke of Loyola to the Protestant Revolution. The Ratio Stuaiorum was just coming into full force, and Gracian was one of the earliest men in Europe to be educated on the system which has dominated the secondary education of Europe almost down to our own days. This point is of some importance, we shall see, in considering Gracian's chief work. Once enrolled among the ranks of the Jesuits, the individual disappears, the Jesuit alone remains. 
there is scarcely anything to record of gratian's life except that he was a jesuit and engaged in teaching what passes with the order for philosophy and sacred literature and became ultimately rector of the jesuit college at tarragona his great friend was don vincencio juan de la stanosa a dilettante of the period who lived at huesca and collected coins medals and other archaeological bric-a-brac gracian appears to have shared his tastes for la stanosa mentions him in his description of his own cabinet a long correspondence with him was once extant and seen by la Tassa, who gives the dates and places where the letters were written from these it would seem that gracian moved about considerably from madrid to saragossa and thence to tarragona from another source we learn that philip the third often had him to dinner to provide attic salt to the royal table he preached and his sermons were popular in short a life of prudent prosperity came to an end when balthasar gracian rector of the jesuit college at tarragona died there on the sixth of december sixteen fifty eight at the age of nearly fifty-eight years of gracian's works there is perhaps more to say even while leaving for separate consideration that one which is here presented to the english reader and forms his chief claim to attention spanish literature was passing into its period of swagger a period that came to all literatures of modern europe after the training in classics had given a fresh the sense of style the characteristic of this period in a literature is suitably enough the appearance of conceits or elaborate and far-fetched figures of speech the process began with antonio guevara author of el libro aureo from which according to some the english form of the disease known as euphuism was derived but it received a further impetus from the success of the stilo culto of gongora in poetry gongorism drove conceit to its farthest point artificiality of diction could go no farther in verse it was only left for gratian to apply it to prose he did this for the first time in sixteen thirty in his first work el héroe this was published like most of his other works by his lifelong friend la stanosa and under the name of lorenzo gratian a suppositious brother of gratian's who so far as can be ascertained never existed the whole of el héroe exists in shortened form in the oraculo manual the form however is so shortened that it would be difficult to recognize the original primores as they are called of el héroe yet it is precisely in the curtness of the sentences that the peculiarity of the stilo culto consists generally elaborate metaphor and far-fetched allusions go with long and involved sentences of the periodic type but with gratian the aim is as much towards shortness as towards elaboration the embroidery is rich but the jacket is short as he himself might have said as for the subject matter the extracts in the oraculo will suffice to give some notion of the lofty ideal or character presented in el héroe the ideal indeed associated in the popular mind with the term hidalgo a later book el discreto first published in sixteen forty seven gives the counterpoise to el héroe by drawing an ideal of the prudent courtier as contrasted with the proud and spotless hidalgo this too is fully represented in the book before us but the curtailment is still more marked than in the case of el héroe there is evidence that gratian wrote a similar pair of contrasts termed respectively el galante and el varon atento which were not published but were incorporated in the oraculo manual by la stanosa the consequences of this utilization of contrasts will concern us later reverting to gratian's works somewhat more in their order his eloge of ferdinand the magus of columbus's epoch need not much detain us it is stilted and conventional and does not betray much historical insight gratian's agudeza y arte de ingenio is of more importance and interest as the formal exposition of the critical principles of cultismo it is concerned more with verse than prose and represents the poetics of gongorism a curious collection of flowers of rhetoric in spanish verse could be made from it of still more restricted interest is the comulgador 
or sacred meditations for holy communion i do not profess to be a judge of this class of literature if literature it can be called but the fact that the book was deemed worthy of an english translation as lately as sixteen seventy six seems to show that it still answers the devotional needs of the catholics it has a personal interest for gratian as it was the only book of his that appeared under his own name there remains only to be considered besides the oraculo manual gratian's el criticon a work of considerable value and at least historic interest which appeared in the three parts dealing with youth maturity and old age respectively during the years sixteen fifty to fifty three this is a kind of philosophic romance or allegory depicting the education of the human soul a spaniard named critilo is wrecked on st helena and there finds a sort of man friday whom he calls andrenio andrenio after learning to communicate with critilo gives him a highly elaborate autobiography of his soul from the age of three days or so they then travel to spain where they meet truth valor falsehood and other allegorical females and males who are labelled by critilo for andrenio's benefit in the approved and frigid style of the allegorical teacher incidentally however the ideals and aspirations of the spaniard of the seventeenth century are brought out and from this point of view the book derives the parallel with the pilgrim's progress which Tickner had made for it it is certainly one of the most characteristic products of spanish literature both for style and subject matter nearly all these works of gratian were translated into most of the cultured languages of europe english not excepted part of this ecumenical fame was doubtless due to the fact that gratian was a jesuit and brethren of his order translated the works of one of whom the order was justly proud but this explanation cannot altogether account for the wide spread of Gratian's works, and there remains a deposit of genuine ability and literary skill involved in most of the works I have briefly referred to, ability and skill of an entirely obsolete kind nowadays, but holding a rank of their own in the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries, when didacticism was all the rage. It is noteworthy that the testimonia I have collected for the most part pass over the oraculo the only work at which a modern would care to cast a second glance and go into raptures over el criticon and its fellows or the reverse of raptures on gratian's style which after all was the most striking thing about his works that style reaches its greatest perfection in the oraculo manual to which we might at once turn but for a preliminary inquiry which it seems worth while to make it is a book of maxims as distinguished from a book of aphorisms and it is worth while for several reasons inquiring into maxims in general and maxim literature in particular before dealing with what is probably the most remarkable specimen of its class before however doing this we may close the section of our introductory remarks by putting in as the lawyers say the latin inscription given by la tassa from the foot of the portrait of gratian which once stood in the Jesuit college at Calatayud, a portrait of which, alas, no trace can now be found. The lines sum up in sufficiently forcible Latin all that need be known of Balthazar Gracian and his works. P. Balthazar Gracian, utiam ab ortu emineret, in bello monte natus est, prope bilbilim, confinis martialis patria proximus ingenio, ut profunderet ad hoc christianas argutias bilbilis quae poeni exaustam videbatur in ethnisis ergo augens natale ingenium in nato acumine scripsit artem ingenii et arte facit scibile quod scibiles facit artes scripsit item artem prudentiae et asse ipso artem didicit scripsit oraculum et voces sues protulit scripsit desertum ut se ipsum describeret et ut scriberet eroem eroica patravit hec et alia eis scripta moecenates reges habuerunt judices admirationem lectorem mundum typographum eternitatem philippus tres sepe ilius argutias 
interprandium versabat ne deficerent sales regiis dapibus sed cui plausus excitaverat calamo deditus missionibus excitavit planctus verbo excitaturus desiderium in morte qua raptus fuit sex decambris anno mille sexaginta quinquaginta octo sed aliquando extintus eternum lucebit two of maxims many men have sought to give their views about man and about life in a pithy way a few have tried to advise man in short sentences what to do in the various emergencies of life the former have written aphorisms the latter maxims where the aphorism states a fact of human nature a maxim advises a certain course of action the aphorism is written in the indicative the maxim in an imperative mood life is interesting if not happy is an aphorism of professor seeley's i believe ascend a step to choose a friend descend a step to choose a wife is a maxim of rabbi Meir, one of the doctors of the talmud now it is indeed curious how few maxims have ever been written wisdom has been extolled on the housetops but her practical advice seems to have been kept secret taking our own literature there are extremely few books of practical maxims and not a single one of any great merit sir walter raleigh's cabinet council penn's maxims and chesterfield's letters almost exhaust the list and the last generally contains much more than mere maxims nor are they scattered with any profusion through books teeming with knowledge of life the galaxy of english novels during recent years extracts of their beauties have been published in some profusion wit and wisdom of beaconsfield wise witty and tender sayings of george eliot extracts from thackeray and the rest but the crop of practical maxims to be found among them is extremely scanty aphorisms there are in plenty especially in george eliot but he that is doubtful what course to pursue in any weighty crisis would woefully waste his time if he sought for advice from the novelists nor are the moralists more instructive in this regard bacon's essays leave with one the impression of fullness of practical wisdom yet closely examined there is very little residue of practical advice left in his pregnant sayings even the source of most of this kind of writing the biblical book of proverbs fails to answer the particular kind of test i am at present applying however shrewd some of them are startling us with the consciousness how little human nature has changed it is knowledge of human nature that they mainly supply when we ask for instruction how to apply that knowledge we only get variations of the theme fear the lord two thousand years of experience have indeed shown that the fear or love of the lord forms a very good foundation for practical wisdom but it has to be supplemented by some such corollary as keep your powder dry before it becomes of direct service in the conduct of life it is indeed because of the unpractical nature of practical maxims that they have been so much neglected you must act in the concrete you can only maximize in general terms then again maxims can only appeal to the mind to the intellect the motive force of action is the will the temperament as disraeli put it the conduct of men depends on the temperament not upon a bunch of musty maxims henrietta temple it is only very distantly that a maxim can stir the vague desire that spurs an imitative will true at times we read of men whose whole life has been coloured by a single saying but these have generally been more appeals to the imagination like newman's securus judicat orbis terrarum or the heu fuge crudelas terras fuge litus avarum which had so decisive an effort on savonarola's life it is rare indeed that a man's whole life is tinged by a single practical maxim like sir daniel gooch who was influenced by his father's advice stick to one thing perhaps one of the reasons that have led literary persons to neglect the maxim as a literary form has been their own ignorance of action and still more their exaggerated notions of its difficulties and complexities affairs are not conducted by aphorisms war is waged by a different kind of maxims from those we are considering yet after all there must be some general principles on which actions should be conducted and one would think they could be determined 
probably the successful men of action are not sufficiently self-observant to know exactly on what their success depends and if they did they would in most cases try to keep it in the family like their wealth or their trade secrets and perhaps after all they are right who declare that action has little to do with intellect and much with character to say the truth one is not impressed with the intellectual powers of the millionaires one meets the shadiest of journalists could often explain their own doings with more point than they yet there are surely intellectual qualifications required for affairs the suez canal must have required as great an amount of research emendation sense of order and organization as say the corpus inscriptionum latinarum but there is no such punishment for slovenly scholarship in action as there is in letters the suez canal can be dug only once lucretius or latin inscriptions can be edited over and over again altogether we need not be surprised if the men of action cannot put the principles of action into pointed sentences or maxims and if men of action cannot it is not surprising that men of letters do not for they cannot have the interest in action and its rewards which is required for worldly success or else they would not be able to concentrate their thoughts on things which they consider of higher import to a man of letters the world is the devil or ought to be if he is to have the touch of idealism which gives colour and weight to his words how then is he to devote his attention to worldly wisdom and the maxims that are to teach it it is characteristic in this connection that the weightiest writer of maxims in our language is bacon who attempted to combine a career of affairs and of thought and spoiled both by so doing it is perhaps due to the subtle and all-embracing influence of christianity on modern civilization that this divorce between idealism and the world has come about the strenuous opposition to the world among earnest christians has led to their practical withdrawal from it just as the celibacy of the clergy meant that the next generation was to be deprived of the hereditary influence of some of the purest spirits of the time so the opposition of christianity to the world has brought it about that the world has been unchristian only one serious attempt has been made to bridge the chasm the idee mere of jesuitism was to make the world christian by christians becoming worldly it was doubtless due to the reaction against the over spiritualization of christianity pressed by the protestant reformation but its practical result has been to make the jesuit a worldly christian the control of the higher education of europe by the jesuits had tended on the other hand to make society more christian if then we were to look for an adequate presentation of worldly wisdom touched with sufficient idealism to make it worthy of a man of letters we should look for it from a jesuit or from one trained among the jesuits after all this elaborate explanation why so few maxims have been composed it may seem contradictory to give as a further and final reason because so many exist under another form for what are the majority of proverbs but maxims under another name or rather maxims without a name of their author we say of proverbs indeed that they arise among the people but it is one definite individual among the people that gives them the piquant form that makes them proverbial it was we may be sure a definite english gaffer who first said pennywise pound foolish if we knew his name we should call it a maxim as his name is unknown it ranks as a proverb in this connection the talmudic proverbs and maxims are of great interest owing to the worthy rabbinic principle say a thing in the name of the man who said it we can in almost all cases trace talmudic proverbs to their authors or in other words talmudic proverbs remain maxims there is only one analogous case in english a few of benjamin franklin's maxims e g three removes are as good as a fire have become proverbs the abundance of proverbs is extraordinary there is a whole bibliography devoted to the literature of proverbs duplessis bibliographie paremiologique paris 1847 and this needs nowadays a supplement as large again as the original partly supplied by the bibliographical appendix of heller altspanische sprichwörter 1883 
indeed in the multitude of proverbs consists the greatest proof of their uselessness as guides of action for by this means we get proverbs at cross purposes thus take the one i have just referred to penny wise pound foolish which has a variant in the proverb do not spoil the ship for a hapworth of tar a man who was hesitating as to the amount or expense he would incur in any undertaking would be prompted by these sayings to be lavish but then how about the proverb take care of the pence and the pounds will take care of themselves between the two proverbs he would come to the ground and if he has the noose to decide between them he does not need the proverbs at all hence it is perhaps that the nation that is richest in proverbs is the one that has proved itself among european peoples the least wise in action to the spaniards has been well applied the witticism about charles the second they never said a foolish thing and never did a wise one certainly if proverbs be a proof of wisdom the spaniards have given proofs in abundance don quixote is full of them and the spanish collections are extraordinarily rich now the nation that can produce good proverbs should be able to produce good maxims hence we should expect the best book of maxims to emanate from a spaniard one characteristic of both these forms of practical wisdom is their artificiality one has to think twice before the point of a proverb or a maxim is perfectly clear the early bird catches the worm seems at first sight as meaningless a proposition as there are milestones on the dover road hence it is when the literature is passing through its artificial stage that maxims would naturally appear so that it was clearly preordained that when the book of maxims should appear it would be by a jesuit so as to be worldly yet not too worldly by a spaniard so that it should have the proverbial ring and during the prevalence of cultismo so that it should have the quaintness to attract attention three of the oraculo manual having thus proved a priori that the ideal book of maxims was destined to be the oraculo manual of balthasar gracian let us proceed to prove our proof as schoolboys do with their sums that it is the best book of maxims is a foregone conclusion because there is none other schopenhauer who translated the book observes that there is nothing like it in german and there is certainly none approaching it in english and if france or italy can produce its superior it is strange that its fame has remained so confined to its native country not that there are not books teaching the art of self-advancement in almost all languages the success of dr smiles volume on self-help is a sufficient instance of this curiously enough dr smiles book has had its greatest success in italy where it has given rise to quite a literatura selfelpista as the italians themselves call it or rather not curiously for if you wish to find the most unromantic set of ideals nowadays you must go search among the romance nations gracian does not however compete with dr smiles he does not deal with broad weisheit he assumes that the vulgar question of bread and butter has been settled in favour of his reader he may be worldly but he is thinking of the great world he writes for man with a position and how to make the most of it nor is the aim he puts before such persons an entirely selfish one the sole advantage of power is that you can do more good is the only rational defence of ambition and gracian employs it maxim two hundred and eighty six indeed the tone of the book is exceptionally high it is impossible to accuse a man of any meanness who is the author of such maxims as one cannot praise a man too much who speaks well of them who speak ill of him one hundred and sixty two friends are a second existence one hundred eleven when to change the conversation when they talk scandal two hundred and fifty in great crisis there is no better companion than a bold heart one hundred and sixty seven the secret of long life lead a good life ninety be able to boast that if gallantry generosity and fidelity were lost in the world man would be able to find them again in your own breast one hundred and sixty five a man of honour should never forget what he is because he sees what others are two hundred and eighty 
and there are whole sections dealing with such topics as rectitude twenty nine sympathy with great minds forty four a genial disposition seventy nine and the like not that he is without the more subtle devices of the worldly wise one could not wish to have anything more cynical or stinging than the following find out each man's thumbscrew twenty six a shrewd man knows that others when they seek him do not seek him but their advantage in him and by him two hundred and fifty two the truth but not the whole truth one hundred and eighty one keep to yourself the final touches of your art two hundred and twelve do not take payment in politeness one hundred and ninety one have a touch of the trader two hundred and thirty two think with the few and speak with the many forty three never have a companion who casts you in the shade one hundred and fifty two never become paradoxical in order to avoid the trite one hundred and forty three do not show your wounded finger one hundred and forty five the characteristic of the book is this combination or rather contrast of high tone and shrewdness Gratian is both wisely worldly and worldly wise after all there does not seem to be any inherent impossibility in the combination there does not seem any radical necessity why a good man should be a fool one always has a certain grudge against thackeray for making his colonel newcomb so silly at times though perhaps the irony the pathos the tragedy of the book required it as a matter of fact the holiest of men have been some of the shrewdest for their friends at least if not for themselves the explanation of the combination in gratian is simple enough he was a jesuit and the jesuits have just that combination of high tone and worldly wisdom as their raison d'être and in the case of the oraculo the mixture was easily effected by gratian or his friend lastanosa for gratian had written at least two series of works in which this contrast was represented by separate books two of these describing the qualities of the hero and the prudent man el eroe and el discreto were published and are represented in the oraculo two others dealing with the gallant and the cautious man el galante and el varon attento are referred to by lastanosa in the preface of el discreto and are also doubtless represented in the book before us one may guess that the section on high-mindedness one hundred and twenty eight or on nobility of feeling one hundred and thirty one comes from el galante while better mad with the rest of the world than wise alone one hundred and thirty three smacks of el varon attento at times we get the two tones curiously intermingled choose an heroic ideal seventy five seems at first sight a noble sentiment but gratian goes on to qualify it by adding but rather to emulate than to imitate the modernness of the tone is the thing that will strike most readers apart from these contrasts here and there one may be struck by an archaic note never compete would scarcely be the advice of a worldly teacher nowadays but on the whole there is a tone of modern good society about the maxims which one would scarcely find in contemporary english works like peachams or even in contemporary french authors like charon the reason is that modern society is permeated by influences which gratian himself represented the higher education of europe for the last two and a half centuries has been in the hands of jesuits or in schools formed on the ratio studiorum and society in the stricter sense traces from the hotel rambouillet where one half the influence was spanish gratian thus directly represents the tone of the two societies which have set the tone of our society of to-day and it is no wonder therefore if he is modern even in his style there is something of a modern epigrammatic ring at times there is the euphuistic quaintness e g one must pass through the circumference of time before arriving at the centre of opportunity but as a rule the terseness and point of the maxim approximate to the modern epigram el excusarse antes de ocasión es culparse might be both the source and the model of qui s'excuse s'accuse 
the terseness is indeed excessive and carried to tacitian extremes a poco saber camino real ultima felicidad el filosofar arto presto si bien cassian jerks out four or five words where a popular preacher would preach a sermon yet i cannot agree with the writers who call him obscure he is one of the writers that make you think before you grasp his meaning but the meaning is there and put plainly enough only tersely and very often indirectly after the manner of proverbs there is indeed no doubt that he and his predecessors were influenced by the form of the spanish proverb in drawing up aphorisms and maxims i say predecessors for aphorismic literature at any rate was no novelty in spain among the long list of books on aphorisms possessed by the late sir william sterling maxwell and still at keir there are fully a dozen spanish ones who precede gracian hernando diaz lopez de corelas and melchior de santa cruz are the most important though the latter is more full of anecdotage among them is a book of aphorismos by antonio perez whose relaciones has been the chief means of blackening philip the second's character the former are undoubtedly of the same style as gracian and probably influenced him though as they are aphorisms and not maxims i have not been able to quote parallels in the notes thus una obra vale miliares de gracias peras aphorismos one one hundred and ninety eight has the same proverbial ring it is curious to see lytton's the pen is mightier than the sword anticipated by peres's la pluma corta mas que espadas afiliadas ibidem one hundred and ninety nine or voltaire's speech was given us to conceal our thoughts in Pereces, las palabras vestido de los conceptos two one hundred and thirty this last example has all gracian's terseness while Pereces, amigos deste siglo rostros humanos corazones de fieras two seventy one has both terseness and cynicism certainly the only other work in spanish or any other literature preceding gracian on anything like the same lines is this book of aphorismos by antonio perez it is somewhat of a question to my mind how far gracian was the author of the final form of the maxims as we have them in the oraculo those taken from el héroe and el discreto differ from their originals with great advantage they are terser more to the point and less euphuistic now the address to the reader has all these qualities and we may assume was written by its signatory don vincentio de la stanosa it is just possible that we owe to him the extreme terseness and point of the majority of the maxims of the oraculum manual it must not however be assumed that they are all as pointed and epigrammatic as those i have quoted gracian seems advisedly to have embedded his jewels in a duller setting at times he vies with the leaders of the great sect of the platitudinarians and he can be as banal as he is brilliant even as it is his very brilliancy wearies and after fifty maxims or so one longs for a more fruity wisdom a more digressive discussion of life like those learned wise and witty essays of mr stevenson which may some day take higher rank as literature than even his novels perhaps after all the weariness to which i refer may be due to the cautious tone of the book to succeed one must be prudent that is the great moral of the book and if so does it seem worth while to succeed if life is to be denuded of the aleatory element is it worth living well gracian meets you when in that temper too it is indeed remarkable how frequently he refers to luck how you are to trust your luck weigh your luck follow your luck know your unlucky days and so forth is all this a confession that after all life is too complex a game for any rules to be of much use granted but there is one thing certain about life and that is put by goethe in the lines which i following schopenhauer have placed at the head of my translation one must be either hammer or anvil in this world and too great an excess of idealism only means that the unideal people shall rule the world to guard against both extremes we have the paradoxical advice i have heard attributed to mr ruskin fit yourself for the best society and then never enter it
whether any ideal person will learn to rule the world by studying gratian's or any one else's maxims is somewhat more doubtful for reasons i have given above in discussing proverbs the man who can act on maxims can act without them and so does not need them and there is the same amount of contradiction in maxims as in proverbs thus to quote an example from the book before us from maxim one hundred and thirty two it would seem best to keep back an intended gift long expected is highest prized whereas from maxim two hundred and thirty six we learn that the promptness of the gift obliges the more strongly which maxim are we to act upon that depends on circumstances and the judgment that can decide on the circumstances can do without the maxims i cannot therefore promise success in the world to whomsoever may read this book otherwise i should perhaps not have published it but whether gratian's maxims are true or useful scarcely affects their value to the student of literature as such the flimsiest sentiment or the merest paradox aptly put is worth the sublimest truth ill expressed and there can be little doubt that gratian puts his points well and vigorously i cannot hope to have reproduced adequately all the vigour and force of his style the subtlety of his distinctions or the shrewdness of his mother wit but enough i hope has emerged during the process of translation to convince the reader that gratian's oraculo manual has much wisdom in small compass and well put end of section two section three of the art of worldly wisdom by balthasar gratian translated by joseph jacobs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by sandra schmidt to the reader no laws for the just no counsels for the wise yet no one ever knew as much as he had need one thing you must forgive another thank me for i have called this manual of worldly wisdom an oracle for it is one in curtness and sententiousness on the other hand i offer you in one all the twelve works of gratian each of these is so highly thought of that his prudent man had scarcely appeared in spain than it was enjoyed among the french in whose language it was translated and at whose court it was printed may this be wisdom's bill of fare at the banquet of her sages in which she inscribes the items of the feast of reason to be found in gratian's other works don vincencio juan de la stanosa one everything is at its acme especially the art of making one's way in the world there is more required nowadays to make a single wise man than formerly to make seven sages and more is needed nowadays to deal with a single person than was required with a whole people in former times two character and intellect the two poles of our capacity one without the other is but halfway to happiness intellect suffices not character is also needed on the other hand it is the fool's misfortune to fail in obtaining the position the employment the neighbourhood and the circle of friends that suit him three keep matters for a time in suspense admiration at their novelty heightens the value of your achievements it is both useless and insipid to play with the cards on the table if you do not declare yourself immediately you arouse expectation especially when the importance of your position makes you the object of general attention mix a little mystery with everything and the very mystery arouses veneration and when you explain be not too explicit just as you do not expose your inmost thoughts in ordinary intercourse cautious silence is the holy of holies of worldly wisdom a resolution declared is never highly thought of it only leaves room for criticism and if it happens to fail you are doubly unfortunate besides you imitate the divine way when you cause men to wander and watch four knowledge and courage are the elements of greatness they give immortality because they are immortal each is as much as he knows and the wise can do anything 
a man without knowledge a world without light wisdom and strength eyes and hands knowledge without courage is sterile five create a feeling of dependence not he that adorns but he that adores makes a divinity the wise man would rather see men needing him than thanking him to keep them on the threshold of hope is diplomatic to trust to their gratitude boorish hope has a good memory gratitude a bad one more is to be got from dependence than from courtesy he that has satisfied his thirst turns his back on the well and the orange once sucked falls from the golden platter into the waste basket when dependence disappears good behaviour goes with it as well as respect let it be one of the chief lessons of experience to keep hope alive without entirely satisfying it by preserving it to make oneself always needed even by a patron on the throne but let not silence be carried to excess lest you go wrong nor let another's failing grow incurable for the sake of your own advantage six a man at his highest point we are not born perfect every day we develop in our personality and in our calling till we reach the highest point of our completed being to the full round of our accomplishments of our excellences this is known by the purity of our taste the clearness of our thought the maturity of our judgment and the firmness of our will some never arrive at being complete somewhat is always wanting others ripen too late the complete man wise in speech prudent in act is admitted to the familiar intimacy of discreet persons is even sought for by them seven avoid victories over superiors all victories breed hate and that over your superior is foolish or fatal superiority is always detested a fortiori superiority over superiority caution can gloss over common advantages for example good looks may be cloaked by careless attire there be some that will grant you precedence in good luck or good temper but none in good sense least of all a prince for good sense is a royal prerogative any claim to that is a case of lese majesty they are princes and wish to be so in that most princely of qualities they will allow a man to help them but not to surpass them and will have any advice tendered them appear like a recollection of something they have forgotten rather than as a guide to something they cannot find the stars teach us this finesse with happy tact though they are his children and brilliant like him they never rival the brilliancy of the sun eight to be without passions tis a privilege of the highest order of mind their very eminence redeems them from being affected by transient and low impulses there is no higher rule than the one over oneself over one's impulses there is the triumph of free will while passion rules the character no aiming at high office the less the higher it is the only refined way of avoiding scandals nay tis the shortest way back to good repute nine avoid the faults of your nation water shares the good or bad qualities of the strata through which it flows and man those of the climate in which he is born some owe more than others to their native land because there is a more favourable sky in the zenith there is not a nation even among the most civilised that has not some fault peculiar to itself which other nations blame by way of boast or as a warning tis a triumph of cleverness to correct in oneself such national failings or even to hide them you get great credit for being unique among your fellows and as it is less expected of you it is esteemed the more there are also family failings as well as faults of position of office or of age if these all meet in one person and are not carefully guarded against they make an intolerable monster ten fortune and fame where the one is fickle the other is enduring the first for life the second afterwards the one against envy 
the other against oblivion fortune is desired at times assisted fame is earned the desire for fame springs from man's best part it was and is the sister of the giants it always goes to extremes horrible monsters or brilliant prodigies end of section three section four of the art of worldly wisdom by balthazar gracian translated by joseph jacobs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by sandra schmidt eleven cultivate those who can teach you let friendly intercourse be a school of knowledge and culture be taught through conversation thus you make your friends your teachers and mingle the pleasures of conversation with the advantages of instruction sensible persons thus enjoy alternating pleasures they reap applause for what they say and gain instruction from what they hear we are always attracted to others by our own interest but in this case it is of a higher kind wise men frequent the houses of great noblemen not because they are temples of vanity but as theatres of good breeding there be gentlemen who have the credit of worldly wisdom because they are not only themselves oracles of all nobleness by their example and their behaviour but those who surround them form a well-bred academy of worldly wisdom of the best and noblest kind twelve nature and art material and workmanship there is no beauty unadorned and no excellence that would not become barbaric if it were not supported by artifice this remedies the evil and improves the good nature scarcely ever gives us the very best for that we must have recourse to art without this the best of natural dispositions is uncultured and half is lacking to any excellence if training is absent every one has something unpolished without artificial training and every kind of excellence needs some polish thirteen act sometimes on second thoughts sometimes on first impulse man's life is a warfare against the malice of men sagacity fights with strategic changes of intention it never does what it threatens it aims only at escaping notice it aims in the air with dexterity and strikes home in an unexpected direction always seeking to conceal its game it lets a purpose appear in order to attract the opponent's attention but then turns round and conquers by the unexpected but a penetrating intelligence anticipates this by watchfulness and lurks in ambush it always understands the opposite of what the opponent wishes it to understand and recognizes every fiend of guile it lets the first impulse pass by and waits for the second or even the third sagacity now rises to higher flights on seeing its artifice foreseen and tries to deceive by truth itself changes its game in order to change its deceit and cheats by not cheating and founds deception on the greatest candor but the opposing intelligence is on guard with increased watchfulness and discovers the darkness concealed by the light and deciphers every move the more subtle because more simple in this way the guile of the python combats the far darting rays of apollo fourteen the thing itself and the way it is done substance is not enough accident is also required as the scholastics say a bad manner spoils everything even reason and justice a good one supplies everything gilds a no sweetens truth and adds a touch of beauty to old age itself the how plays a large part in affairs a good manner steals into the affections fine behaviour is a joy in life and a pleasant expression helps out of a difficulty in a remarkable way fifteen keep ministering spirits it is a privilege of the mighty to surround themselves with the champions of intellect these extricate them from every fear of ignorance these worry out for them the mood points of every difficulty tis a rare greatness to make use of the wise and far exceeds the barbarous taste of tigranes who had a fancy for captive monarchs as his servants it is a novel kind of supremacy the best that life can offer 
to have as servants by skill those who by nature are our masters tis a great thing to know little to live no real life without knowledge there is remarkable cleverness in studying without study in getting much by means of many and through them all to become wise afterwards you speak in the council chamber on behalf of many and as many sages speak through your mouth as were consulted beforehand you thus obtain the fame of an oracle by others toil such ministering spirits distil the best books and serve up the quintessence of wisdom but he that cannot have sages in service should have them for his friends sixteen knowledge and good intentions together ensure continuance of success a fine intellect wedded to a wicked will was always an unnatural monster a wicked will envenoms all excellences helped by knowledge it only ruins with greater subtlety tis a miserable superiority that only results in ruin knowledge without sense is double folly seventeen vary the mode of action not always the same way so as to distract attention especially if there be a rival not always from first impulse they will soon recognize the uniformity and by anticipating frustrate your designs it is easy to kill a bird on the wing that flies straight not so one that twists nor always act on second thoughts they can discern the plan the second time the enemy is on the watch great skill is required to circumvent him the gamester never plays the card the opponent expects still less that which he wants eighteen application and ability there is no attaining eminence without both and where they unite there is the greatest eminence mediocrity obtains more with application than superiority without it work is the price which is paid for reputation what costs little is little worth even for the highest posts it is only in some cases application that is wanting rarely the talent to prefer moderate success in great things than eminence in a humble post has the excuse of a generous mind but not so to be content with humble mediocrity when you could shine among the highest thus nature and art are both needed and application sets on them the seal nineteen arouse no exaggerated expectations on entering it is the usual ill luck of all celebrities not to fulfil afterwards the expectations beforehand formed of them the real can never equal the imagined for it is easy to form ideals but very difficult to realise them imagination weds hope and gives birth to much more than things are in themselves however great the excellences they never suffice to fulfil expectations and as men find themselves disappointed with their exorbitant expectations they are more ready to be disillusioned than to admire hope is a great falsifier of truth let skill guard against this by ensuring that fruition exceeds desire a few creditable attempts at the beginning are sufficient to arouse curiosity without pledging one to the final object it is better that reality should surpass the design and is better than was thought this rule does not apply to the wicked for the same exaggeration is a great aid to them they are defeated amid general applause and what seemed at first extreme ruin comes to be thought quite bearable twenty a man of the age the rarest individuals depend on their age it is not every one that finds the age he deserves and even when he finds it he does not always know how to utilize it some men have been worthy of a better century for every species of good does not always triumph things have their period even excellences are subject to fashion the sage has one advantage he is immortal if this is not his century many others will be end of section four section five of the art of worldly wisdom by balthasar grafian translated by joseph jacobs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by sandra schmidt twenty one the art of being lucky there are rules of luck it is not all chance with the wise 
it can be assisted by care some content themselves with placing themselves confidently at the gate of fortune waiting till she opens it others do better and press forward and profit by their clever boldness reaching the goddess and winning her favour on the wings of their virtue and valour but on a true philosophy there is no other umpire than virtue and insight for there is no luck or ill luck except wisdom and the reverse twenty two a man of knowledge to the point wise men arm themselves with tasteful and elegant erudition a practical knowledge of what is going on not of a common kind but more like an expert they possess a copious store of wise and witty sayings and of noble deeds and know how to employ them on fitting occasions more is often taught by a jest than by the most serious teaching pet knowledge helps some more than the seven arts be they ever so liberal twenty three be spotless the indispensable condition of perfection few live without some weak point either physical or moral which they pamper because they could easily cure it the keenness of others often regrets to see a slight defect attaching itself to a whole assembly of elevated qualities and yet a single cloud can hide the whole of the sun there are likewise patches on our reputation which ill-will soon finds out and is continually noticing the highest skill is to transform them into ornament so caesar hid his natural defects with the laurel twenty four keep the imagination under control sometimes correcting sometimes assisting it for it is all important for our happiness and even sets the reason right it can tyrannize and is not content with looking on but influences and even often dominates life causing it to be happy or burdensome according to the folly to which it leads for it makes us either contented or discontented with ourselves before some it continually holds up the penalties of action and becomes the mortifying lash of these fools to others it promises happiness and adventure with blissful delusion it can do all this unless the most prudent self-control keeps it in subjection twenty five know how to take a hint twas once the art of arts to be able to discourse now tis no longer sufficient we must know how to take a hint especially in disabusing ourselves he cannot make himself understood who does not himself easily understand but on the other hand there are pretended diviners of the heart and lynxes of the intentions the very truths which concern us most can only be half spoken but with attention we can grasp the whole meaning when you hear anything favourable keep a tight rein on your credulity if unfavourable give it the spur twenty six find out each man's thumbscrew tis the art of setting their wills in action it needs more skill than resolution you must know where to get at any one every volition has a special motive which varies according to taste all men are idolaters some of fame others of self-interest most of pleasure skill consists in knowing these idols in order to bring them into play knowing any man's mainspring of motive you have as it were the key to his will have resort to primary motors which are not always the highest but more often the lowest part of his nature there are more dispositions badly organized than well first guess a man's ruling passion appeal to it by a word set it in motion by temptation and you will infallibly give checkmate to his freedom of will twenty seven prize intensity more than extent excellence resides in quality not in quantity the best is always few and rare much lowers value even among men giants are commonly the real dwarfs some reckon books by the thickness as if they were written to try the brawn more than the brain extent alone never rises above mediocrity it is the misfortune of universal geniuses that in attempting to be at home everywhere are so nowhere intensity gives eminence and rises to the heroic in matters sublime twenty eight 
common in nothing first not in taste o oh, great and wise to be ill at ease when your deeds please the mob the excesses of popular applause never satisfy the sensible some there are such chameleons of popularity that they find enjoyment not in the sweet savours of apollo but in the breath of the mob secondly not in intelligence take no pleasure in the wonder of the mob for ignorance never gets beyond wonder while vulgar folly wonders wisdom watches for the trick twenty nine a man of rectitude clings to the sect of right with such tenacity of purpose that neither the passions of the mob nor the violence of the tyrant can ever cause him to transgress the bounds of right but who shall be such a phoenix of equity what a scanty following has rectitude many praise it indeed but for others others follow it till danger threatens then the false deny it the politic conceal it for it cares not if it fights with friendship power or even self-interest then comes the danger of desertion then astute men make plausible distinctions so as not to stand in the way of their superiors or of reasons of state but the straightforward and constant regard dissimulation as a kind of treason and set more store on tenacity than on sagacity such are always to be found on the side of truth and if they desert a party they do not change from fickleness but because the others have first deserted truth thirty have naught to do with occupations of ill repute still less with fads that bring more notoriety than repute there are many fanciful sects and from all the prudent man has to flee there are bizarre tastes that always take to their heart all that wise men repudiate they live in love with singularity this may make them well known indeed but more as objects of ridicule than of repute a cautious man does not even make profession of his wisdom still less of those matters that make their followers ridiculous these need not be specified for common contempt has sufficiently singled them out end of section five Section six of the Art of Worldly Wisdom by Balthasar Gracian translated by Joseph Jacobs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sandra Schmidt thirty one Select the Lucky and Avoid the Unlucky. Ill luck is generally the penalty of folly, and there is no disease so contagious to those who share in it. Never open the door to a lesser evil for other and greater ones invariably slink in after it the greatest skill at cards is to know when to discard it the smallest of current trumps is worth more than the ace of trumps of the last game when in doubt follow the suit of the wise and the prudent sooner or later they will win the odd trick thirty two have the reputation of being gracious tis the chief glory of the high and mighty to be gracious a prerogative of kings to conquer universal good will that is the great advantage of a commanding position to be able to do more good than others those make friends who do friendly acts on the other hand there are some who lay themselves out for not being gracious not on account of the difficulty but from a bad disposition in all things they are the opposite of divine grace thirty three know how to withdraw if it is a great lesson in life to know how to deny it is still greater to know how to deny oneself as regards both affairs and persons there are extraneous occupations which eat away precious time to be occupied in what does not concern you is worse than doing nothing it is not enough for a careful man not to interfere with others he must see that they do not interfere with him one is not obliged to belong so much to all as not to belong at all to oneself so with friends their help should not be abused or more demanded from them than they themselves will grant all access is a failing but above all in personal intercourse a wise moderation in this best preserves the good will and esteem of all for by this means 
that precious boon of courtesy is not gradually worn away thus you preserve your genius free to select the elect and never sin against the unwritten laws of good taste thirty four know your strongest point your pre-eminent gift cultivate that and you will assist the rest every one would have excelled in something if he had known his strong point notice in what quality you surpass and take charge of that in some judgment excels in others valour most do violence to their natural aptitude and thus attain superiority in nothing time disillusionizes us too late of what first flattered the passions thirty five think over things most over the most important all fools come to grief from want of thought they never see even the half of things and as they do not observe their own loss or gain still less do they apply any diligence to them some make much of what imports little and little of much always weighing in the wrong scale many never lose their common sense because they have none to lose there are matters which should be observed with the closest attention of the mind and thenceforth kept in its lowest depths the wise man thinks over everything but with a difference most profoundly where there is some profound difficulty and thinks that perhaps there is more in it than he thinks thus his comprehension extends as far as his apprehension thirty six in acting or refraining weigh your luck more depends on that than on noticing your temperament if he is a fool who at forty applies to hippocrates for health still more is he one who then applies to seneca for wisdom it is a great piece of skill to know how to guide your luck even while waiting for it for something is to be done with it by waiting so as to use it at the proper moment since it has periods and offers opportunities though one cannot calculate its path its steps are so irregular when you find fortune favourable stride boldly forward for she favours the bold and being a woman the young but if you have bad luck keep retired so as not to redouble the influence of your unlucky star thirty seven keep a store of sarcasms and know how to use them this is the point of greatest tact in human intercourse such sarcasms are often thrown out to test man's mood and by their means one often obtains the most subtle and penetrating touchstone of the heart other sarcasms are malicious insolent poisoned by envy or envenomed by passion unexpected flashes which destroy at once all favour and esteem struck by the slightest word of this kind many fall away from the closest intimacy with superiors or inferiors which could not be the slightest shaken by a whole conspiracy of popular insinuation or private malevolence other sarcasms on the other hand work favourably confirming and assisting one's reputation but the greater the skill with which they are launched the greater the caution with which they should be received and the foresight with which they should be foreseen for here a knowledge of the evil is in itself a means of defence and the shot foreseen always misses its mark thirty eight leave your luck while winning all the best players do it a fine retreat is as good as a gallant attack bring your exploits under cover when there are enough or even when there are many of them luck long lasting was ever suspicious interrupted seems safer and is even sweeter to the taste for a little infusion of bitter sweet the higher the heap of luck the greater the risk of a slip and down comes all fortune pays you sometimes for the intensity of her favours by the shortness of their duration she soon tires of carrying any one long on her shoulders thirty nine recognize when things are ripe and then enjoy them the works of nature all reach a certain point of maturity up to that they improve after that they degenerate few works of art reach such a point that they cannot be improved it is an especial privilege of good taste to enjoy everything at its ripest not all can do this nor do all who can know this 
there is a ripening point too for fruits of intellect it is well to know this both for their value in use and for their value in exchange forty the good will of people tis much to gain universal admiration more universal love something depends on natural disposition more on practice the first founds the second then builds on that foundation brilliant parts suffice not though they are presupposed win good opinion it is easy to win good will kindly acts besides are required to produce kindly feelings doing good with both hands good words and better deeds loving so as to be loved courtesy is the politic witchery of great personages first lay hand on deeds and then on pens words follow swords for there is good will to be won among writers and it is eternal end of section six section seven of the art of worldly wisdom this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer visit librivox.org recorded by linda sonrisa servision.org the art of worldly wisdom by baltasar gracian translated by joseph jacobs section seven forty one never exaggerate it is an important object of attention not to talk in superlatives so as neither to offend against truth nor to give a mean idea of one's understanding exaggeration is a prodigality of the judgment which shows the narrowness of one's knowledge or one's taste praise arouses lively curiosity begets desire and if afterwards the value does not correspond to the price as generally happens expectation revolts against the deception and revenges itself by underestimating the thing recommended and the person recommending a prudent man goes more cautiously to work and prefers to err by omission than by commission extraordinary things are rare therefore moderate ordinary valuation exaggeration is a branch of lying and you lose by it the credit of good taste which is much and of good sense which is more forty two born to command it is a secret force of superiority not to have to get on by artful trickery but by an inborn power of rule all submit to it without knowing why recognizing the secret vigor of connatural authority such magisterial spirits are kings by merit and lions by innate privilege by the esteem which they inspire they hold the hearts and minds of the rest if their other qualities permit such men are born to be the prime motors of the state they perform more by a gesture than others by a long harangue forty three think with the few and speak with the many by swimming against the stream it is impossible to remove error easy to fall into danger only a socrates can undertake it to dissent from others views is regarded as an insult because it is their condemnation disgust is doubled on account of the thing blamed and of the person who praised it truth is for the few error is both common and vulgar the wise man is not known by what he says on the housetops for there he speaks not with his own voice but with that of common folly however much his inmost thoughts may gainsay it the prudent avoid being contradicted as much as contradicting though they have their censure ready they are not ready to publish it thought is free force cannot and should not be used to it the wise man therefore retires into silence and if he allows himself to come out of it he does so in the shade and before few and fit persons 44. Sympathy with Great Minds It is an heroic quality to agree with heroes. Tis like a miracle of nature for mystery and for use. 
there is a natural kinship of hearts and minds. Its effects are such that vulgar ignorance scents witchcraft. Esteem established, goodwill follows, which at times reaches affection. It persuades without words and obtains without earning. This sympathy is sometimes active, sometimes passive. Both are like philosophic, the more so, the more sublime. Tis a great art to recognize, to distinguish, and to utilize this gift. No amount of energy suffices without that favor of nature. 45. Use, but do not abuse, cunning. One ought not to delight in it, still less to boast of it. Everything artificial should be concealed, most of all cunning, which is hated. Deceit is much in use, therefore our caution has to be redoubled, but not so as to show itself, for it arouses distrust, causes much annoy, awakens revenge, and gives rise to more ills than you would imagine. To go to work with caution is of great advantage in action, and there is no greater proof of wisdom. The greatest skill in any deed consists in the sure mastery with which it is executed. 46. Master Your Antipathies We often allow ourselves to take dislikes, and that before we know anything of a person. At times this innate yet vulgar aversion attaches itself to eminent personalities. Good sense masters this feeling, for there is nothing more discreditable than to dislike those better than ourselves. As sympathy with great men ennobles us, so dislike to them degrades us. 47. Avoid Affairs of Honor One of the chiefest aims of prudence. In men of great ability, the extremes are kept far asunder, so that there is a long distance between them, and they always keep in the middle of their caution, so that they take time to break through it. It is easier to avoid such affairs than to come well out of them. They test our judgment. It is better to avoid them than to conquer in them. One affair of honor leads to another, and may lead to an affair of dishonor. There are men so constituted by nature or by nation that they easily enter upon such obligations. But for him that walks by the light of reason, such a matter requires long thinking over. There is more valor needed not to take up the affair than to conquer in it. When there is one fool ready for the occasion, one may excuse oneself from being the second. 48. Be thorough. How much depends on the person. The interior must be at least as much as the exterior. How much depends on the person. The interior must be at least as much as the exterior. There are natures all frontage, like houses for want of means have the portico of a palace leading to the rooms of a cottage. It is no use boring into such persons, although they bore you, for conversation flags after the first salutation. They prance through the first compliments like Sicilian barbs, but silence soon succeeds, for the flow of words soon ceases where there is no spring of thoughts. Others may be taken in by them because they themselves have but a view of the surface, but not the prudent, who look within them and find nothing there except material for scorn. 49. Observation and Judgment a man with these rules things, not they him. He sounds at once the profoundest depths. He is a phrenologist by means of physiognomy. On seeing a person he understands him and judges of his inmost nature. From a few observations he deciphers the most hidden recesses of his nature. Keen observation, subtle insight, judicious inference. With these he discovers, notices, grasps, and comprehends everything. 50. Never lose self-respect, or be too familiar with oneself. Let your own right feeling be the true standard of your rectitude, and owe more to the strictness of your own self-judgment than to all external sanctions. Leave off anything unseemly more from regard for your own self-respect 
than from fear of external authority. Pay regard to that, and there is no need of Seneca's imaginary tutor. End of section 7「Section 8 of the Art of Worldly Wisdom. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Sonrisa, SirVision.org. The Art of Worldly Wisdom by Balthasar Gracian. Translated by Joseph Jacobs. Section 8. 51. Know how to choose well. Most of life depends thereon. It needs good taste and correct judgment, for which neither intellect nor study suffices. To be choice you must choose, and for this two things are needed, to be able to choose at all, and then to choose the best. There are many men of fecund and subtle mind, of keen judgment, of much learning, and of great observation, who yet are at a loss when they come to choose. They always take the worst, as if they had tried to go wrong. Thus this is one of the greatest gifts from above. 52. Never be put out. Tis a great aim of prudence never to be embarrassed. It is the sign of a real man, of a noble heart, for magnanimity is not easily put out. The passions are the humors of the soul, and every excess in them weakens prudence. If they overflow through the mouth, the reputation will be in danger. Let a man, therefore, be so much and so great a master over himself, that neither in the most fortunate nor in the most adverse circumstances can anything cause his reputation injury by disturbing his self-possession, but rather enhance it by showing his superiority. 53. Diligent and Intelligent Diligence promptly executes what intelligence slowly excogitates. Hurry is the failing of fools. They know not the crucial point, and set to work without preparation. On the other hand, the wise more often fail from procrastination. Foresight begets deliberation, and remiss action often nullifies prompt judgment. Celerity is the mother of good fortune. He has done much, who leaves nothing over till tomorrow. Festina Lente is a royal motto. 54. Know how to show your teeth. Even hares can pull the mane of a dead lion. There is no joke about courage. Give way to the first, and you must yield to the second, and so on till the last, and to gain your point at last costs as much trouble as would have gained much more at first. Moral courage exceeds physical. It should be like a sword kept ready for use in the scabbard of caution. It is the shield of great place. Moral cowardice lowers one more than physical. Many have had eminent qualities, yet, for want of a stout heart, they passed inanimate lives and found a tomb in their own sloth. Wise nature has thoughtfully combined in the bee the sweetness of its honey with the sharpness of its sting. 55. Wait. It's a sign of a noble heart dowered with patience never to be in a hurry, never to be in a passion. First be master over yourself if you would be master over others. You must pass through the circumference of time before arriving at the center of opportunity. A wise reserve seasons the aims and matures the means. Time's crutch affects more than the iron club of Hercules. God himself chasteneth not with a rod, but with time. He spake a great word who said, Time and I against any two. Charles V. Fortune herself rewards waiting with the first prize. 56. Have presence of mind. The child of a happy promptitude of spirit. Owing to this vivacity and wide awakeness, there is no fear of danger or mischance. Many reflect much only to go wrong in the end. Others attain their aim without thinking of it beforehand. There are natures of antiperistasis who work best in an emergency. They are like monsters who succeed in all they do offhand, but fail in aught they think over. 
a thing occurs to them at once or never for them there is no court of appeal celerity wins applause because it proves remarkable capacity subtlety of judgment prudence in action fifty seven slow and sure early enough if well quickly done can be quickly undone to last an eternity requires an eternity of preparation only excellence counts only achievement endures profound intelligence is the only foundation for immortality worth much costs much the precious metals are the heaviest fifty eight adapt yourself to your company there is no need to show your ability before every one employ no more force than is necessary let there be no unnecessary expenditure either of knowledge or of power the skilful falconer only flies enough birds to serve for the chase if there is too much display to-day there will be nothing to show to-morrow always have some novelty wherewith to dazzle to show something fresh each day keeps expectation alive and conceals the limits of capacity fifty nine finish off well in the house of fortune if you enter by the gate of pleasure you must leave by that of sorrow and vice versa you ought therefore to think of the finish and attach more importance to a graceful exit than to applause on entrance tis the common lot of the unlucky to have a very fortunate outset and a very tragic end the important point is not the vulgar applause on entrance that comes to nearly all but the general feeling at exit few in life are felt to deserve an encore fortune rarely accompanies any one to the door warmly as she may welcome the coming she speeds but coldly the parting guest sixty a sound judgment some are born wise and with this natural advantage enter upon their studies with a moiety already mastered with age and experience their reason ripens and thus they attain a sound judgment they abhor everything whimsical as leading prudence astray especially in matters of state where certainty is so necessary owing to the importance of the affairs involved such men deserve to stand by the helm of state either as pilots or as men at the wheel end of section eight the art of worldly wisdom this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Sonrisa, Servision.org. The Art of Worldly Wisdom by Baltasar Gracian. Section 9. 61. To excel in what is excellent. A great rarity among excellences. You cannot have a great man without something pre-eminent. Mediocrities never win applause. Eminence in some distinguished post distinguishes one from the vulgar mob and ranks us with the elect. To be distinguished in a small post is to be great in little. The more comfort, the less glory. The highest eminence in great affairs has the royal characteristic of exciting admiration and winning goodwill. 62. Use good instruments. Some would have the subtlety of their wits proven by the meanness of their instruments. Tis a dangerous satisfaction and deserves a fatal punishment. The excellence of a minister never diminished the greatness of his lord. All the glory of exploits reverts to the principal actor, also all the blame. Fame only does business with principles. She does not say, This had good, that had bad servants. But this was a good artist, that a bad one. Let your assistants be selected and tested therefore, for you have to trust to them for an immortality of fame. 63. To be the first of the kind is an excellence, and to be eminent in it as well, a double one. To have the first move is a great advantage when the players are equal. 
many a man would have been a veritable phoenix if he had been the first of the sort those who come first are the heirs of fame the others get only a younger brother's allowance whatever they do they cannot persuade the world they are anything more than parrots the skill of prodigies may find a new path to eminence but prudence accompanies them all the way by the novelty of their enterprises sage write their names in the golden book of heroes some prefer to be first in things of minor import than second in greater exploits sixty four avoid worry such prudence brings its own reward it escapes much and is thus the midwife of comfort and so of happiness neither give nor take bad news unless it can help some men's ears are stuffed with the sweets of flattery others with the bitters of scandal while some cannot live without a daily annoyance no more than mithridates could without poison it is no rule of life to prepare for yourself lifelong trouble in order to give a temporary enjoyment to another however near and dear you never ought to spoil your own chances to please another who advises and keeps out of the affair and in all cases where to oblige another involves disobliging yourself tis a standing rule that it is better he should suffer now than you afterwards and in vain sixty five elevated taste you can train it like the intellect full knowledge whets desire and increases enjoyment you may know a noble spirit by the elevation of his taste it must be a great thing that can satisfy a great mind big bites for big mouths lofty things for lofty spirits before their judgment the bravest tremble the most perfect lose confidence things of the first importance are few let appreciation be rare taste can be imparted by intercourse great good luck to associate with the highest taste but do not affect to be dissatisfied with everything tis the extreme of folly and more odious if from affectation than if from quixotry some would have god create another world and other ideals to satisfy their fantastic imagination sixty six see that things end well some regard more the rigor of the game than the winning of it but to the world the discredit of the final failure does away with any recognition of the previous care the victor need not explain the world does not notice the details of the measures employed but only the good or ill result you lose nothing if you gain your end a good end gilds everything however unsatisfactory the means thus at times it is part of the art of life to transgress the rules of the art if you cannot end well otherwise sixty seven prefer callings and evidence most things depend on the satisfaction of others esteem is to excellence what the zephyr is to flowers the breath of life there are some callings which gain universal esteem while others more important are without credit the former pursued before the eyes of all obtain the universal favor the others though they are rarer and more valuable remain obscure and unperceived honored but not applauded among princes conquerors are the most celebrated and therefore the kings of aragon earn such applause as warriors conquerors and great men an able man will prefer callings and evidence which all men know of and utilize and he thus becomes immortalized by universal suffrage sixty eight it is better to help with intelligence than with memory the more as the latter needs only recollection the former vous many persons omit the apropos because it does not occur to them a friend's advice on such occasions may enable them to see the advantages tis one of the greatest gifts of mind to be able to offer what is needed at the moment for want of that many things fail to be performed share the light of your intelligence when you have any and ask for it when you have it not the first cautiously the last anxiously 
give no more than a hint this finesse is especially needful when it touches the interest of him whose attention you awaken you should give but a taste at first and then pass on to more when that is not sufficient if he thinks of no go in search of yes therein lies the cleverness for most things are not obtained simply because they are not attempted sixty nine he is a great man who never allows himself to be influenced by the impressions of others self-reflection is the school of wisdom to know one's disposition and to allow for it even going to the other extreme so as to find the juste milieu between nature and art self-knowledge is the beginning of self-improvement there be some whose humors are so monstrous that they are always under the influence of one or the other of them and put them in place of their real inclinations they are torn asunder by such disharmony and get involved in contradictory obligations such excesses not only destroy firmness of will all power of judgment gets lost desire and knowledge pulling in opposite directions seventy know how to refuse one ought not to give way in everything nor to everybody to know how to refuse is therefore as important as to know how to consent this is especially the case with men of position all depends on the how some men's no is thought of more than the yes of others for a gilded no is more satisfactory than a dry yes there are some who always have no on their lips whereby they make everything distasteful no always comes first with them and when sometimes they give way after all it does them no good on account of the unpleasing herald your refusal need not be point-blank let the disappointment come by degrees nor let the refusal be final that would be to destroy dependence let some spice of hope remain to soften the rejection let politeness compensate and fine words supply the place of deeds yes and no are soon said but give much to think over end of section nine Section 10 of The Art of Worldly Wisdom. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Sonrisa, Survision.org. The Art of Worldly Wisdom by Baltasar Gracian. Translated by Joseph Jacobs. Section 10. 71 do not vacillate let not your actions be abnormal either from disposition or affectation an able man is always the same in his best qualities he gets the credit of trustworthiness if he changes he does so for good reason or good consideration in matters of conduct change is hateful there are some who are different every day their intelligence varies still more their will and with this their fortune Yesterday's white is today's black. Today's no was yesterday's yes. They always give the lie to their own credit and destroy their credit with others. 72. Be resolute. Bad execution of your designs does less harm than irresolution in forming them. Streams do less harm flowing than when dammed up. There are some men so infirm of purpose that they always require direction from others and this not on account of any perplexity for they judge clearly but from sheer incapacity for action it needs some skill to find out difficulties but more to find a way out of them there are others who are never in straits their clear judgment and determined character fit them for the highest callings their intelligence tells them where to insert the thin end of the wedge their resolution how to drive it home they soon get through anything as soon as they have done with one sphere of action, they are ready for another. Affiance to fortune, they make themselves sure of success. 73. Utilize slips. That is how smart people get out of difficulties. They extricate themselves from the most intricate labyrinth by some witty application of a bright remark. 
they get out of a serious contention, by an airy nothing, or by raising a smile. Most of the great leaders are well grounded in this art. When you have to refuse, it is often the polite way to talk of something else. Sometimes it proves the highest understanding not to understand. 74. Do not be unsociable. The truest wild beasts live in the most populous places. To be inaccessible is the fault of those who distrust themselves, whose honors change their manners. It is no way of earning people's good will by being ill-tempered with them. It is a sight to see one of those unsociable monsters who make a point of being proudly impertinent. Their dependents, who have the misfortune to be obliged to speak with them, enter as if prepared for a fight with a tiger, armed with patience and with fear. To obtain their post, these persons must have ingratiated themselves with everyone, but having once obtained it, they seek to indemnify themselves by disobliging all. It is a condition of their position that they should be accessible to all, yet from pride or spleen they are so to none. Tis a civil way to punish such men by letting them alone, and depriving them of opportunities of improvement, by granting them no opportunity of intercourse. 75. Choose an heroic ideal. But rather to emulate than to imitate, there are exemplars of greatness, living texts of honor. Let every one have before his mind the chief of his calling, not so much to follow him as to spur himself on. Alexander wept, not on account of Achilles dead and buried, but over himself, because his fame had not yet spread throughout the world. Nothing arouses ambition so much in the heart as the trumpet clang of another's fame. The same thing that sharpens envy nourishes a generous spirit. 76. Do not always be jesting. Wisdom is shown in serious matters and is more appreciated than mere wit. He that is always ready for jests is never ready for serious things. They resemble liars in that men never believe either, always expecting a lie in one, a joke in the other. One never knows when you speak with judgment, which is the same as if you had none. A continual jest soon loses all zest. Many get the rapture of being witty, but thereby lose the credit of being sensible. Jest has its little hour. Seriousness should have all the rest. 77. Be all things to all men. A discreet Proteus, learned with the learned, saintly with the sainted. It is the great art to gain everyone's suffrages. Their good will gains general agreement. Notice men's moods and adapt yourself to each, genial or serious as the case may be. Follow their lead, glossing over the changes as cunningly as possible. This is an indispensable art for dependent persons. But this savoir-faire calls for great cleverness. He only will find no difficulty who has a universal genius in his knowledge and universal ingenuity in his wit. 78. The Art of Undertaking Things Fools rush in through the door, for folly is always bold. The same simplicity which robs them of all attention to precautions deprives them of all sense of shame at failure. But prudence enters with more deliberation. Its forerunners are caution and care. They advance and discover whether you can also advance without danger. Every rush forward is freed from danger by caution, while fortune sometimes helps in such cases. Step cautiously where you suspect depth. Sagacity goes cautiously forward while precaution covers the ground. Nowadays there are unsuspected depths in human intercourse. You must therefore cast the lead at every step. 79. A genial disposition, if, with moderation, is an accomplishment, not a defect. A grain of gaiety seasons all. The greatest men join in the fun at times, and it makes them liked by all but they should always on such occasions preserve their dignity, nor go beyond the bounds of decorum. Others, again, get themselves out of difficulty quickest by a joke, for there are things you must take in fun, though others perhaps mean them in earnest. You show a sense of placability, which acts as a magnet on all hearts. 80. Take care to get information. We live by information, not by sight. We exist by faith in others. 
the ear is the area gate of truth but the front door of lies the truth is generally seen rarely heard seldom she comes in elemental purity especially from afar there is always some admixture of the moods of those through whom she has passed the passions tinge her with their colours wherever they touch her sometimes favourably sometimes the reverse she always brings out the disposition therefore receive her with caution from him that praises with more caution from him that blames pay attention to the intention of the speaker you should know beforehand on what footing he comes let reflection assay falsity and exaggeration end of section ten section eleven of the art of worldly wisdom this is the librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda sonrisa Survision.org. The Art of Worldly Wisdom by Baltasar Gracian, translated by Joseph Jacobs. 81. Renew your brilliance. Tis the privilege of the phoenix. Ability is wont to grow old, and with it fame. The staleness of custom weakens admiration, and a mediocrity that's new often eclipses the highest excellence grown old. Try, therefore, to be born again in valor, in genius, in fortune, in all. Display startling novelties. Rise afresh like the sun every day. Change, too, the scene on which you shine, so that your loss may be felt in the old scenes of your triumph, while the novelty of your powers wins you applause in the new. 82. Drain nothing to the dregs, neither good nor ill. A sage once reduced all virtue to the golden mean. Push right to the extreme, and it becomes wrong. Press all the juice from an orange, and it becomes bitter. Even in enjoyment, never go to extremes. Thought too subtle is dull. If you milk a cow too much, you draw blood, not milk. 83. Allow yourself some venial fault. Some such carelessness is often the greatest recommendation of talent. For envy exercises ostracism, most envenomed when most polite. It counts it to perfection as a failing that it has no faults. For being perfect in all, it condemns it in all. It becomes an argus, all eyes for imperfection. Tis its only consolation. Blame is like the lightning. It hits the highest. Let Homer nod now and then, and affect some negligence in valor, or in intellect, not in prudence, so as to disarm malevolence, or at least to prevent its bursting with its own venom. You thus leave your cloak on the horns of envy in order to save your immortal parts. 84. Make use of your enemies. You should learn to seize things not by the blade which cuts, but by the handle which saves you from harm. Especially is this the rule with the doings of your enemies. A wise man gets more use from his enemies than a fool from his friends. Their ill will often levels mountains of difficulties which one would otherwise not face. Many have had their greatness made for them by their enemies. Flattery is more dangerous than hatred, because it covers the stains which the other causes to be wiped out. The wise will turn ill will into a mirror more faithful than that of kindness, and remove or improve the faults referred to. Caution thrives well when rivalry and ill will our next-door neighbors. 85. Do not play Manville. It is a fault of excellence that being so much in use, it is liable to abuse. Because all covet it, all are vexed by it. It is a great misfortune to be of use to nobody, scarcely less to be of use to everybody. And people who reach this stage lose by gaining, and at last bore those who desired them before. These manils wear away all kinds of excellence. Losing the earlier esteem of the few, they obtain discredit among the vulgar. The remedy against this extreme is to moderate your brilliance. Be extraordinary in your excellence, if you like, but be ordinary in your display of it. The more light a torch gives, 
the more it burns away, and the nearer it is to going out. Show yourself less, and you will be rewarded by being esteemed more. 86. Prevent Scandal Many heads go to make the mob, and in each of them are eyes for malice to use, and a tongue for detraction to wag. If a single ill report spread, it casts a blemish on your fair fame, and if it clings to you with a nickname, your reputation is in danger. Generally it is some salient defect or ridiculous trait that gives rise to the rumors. At times these are malicious additions of private envy to general distrust. For there are wicked tongues that ruin a great reputation more easily by a witty sneer than by a direct accusation. It is easy to get into bad repute, because it is easy to believe evil of any one. It is not easy to clear yourself. The wise, accordingly, avoid these mischances, guarding against vulgar scandal with sedulous vigilance. It is far easier to prevent than to rectify. 87. Culture and Elegance Man is a born barbarian, and only raises himself above the beast by culture. Culture therefore makes the man, the more a man, the higher. Thanks to it, Greece could call the rest of the world barbarians. Ignorance is very raw, nothing contributes so much to culture as knowledge, but even knowledge is coarse, if without elegance. Not alone must our intelligence be elegant, but our desires, and above all, our conversation. Some men are naturally elegant in internal and external qualities, in their thoughts, in their address, in their dress, which is the rind of the soul, and in their talents, which is its fruit. There are others, on the other hand, so gauche that everything about them, even their very excellencies, is tarnished by an intolerable and barbaric want of neatness. 88. Let your behavior be fine and noble. A great man ought not to be little in his behavior. He ought never to pry too minutely into things, least of all in unpleasant matters. For though it is important to know all, it is not necessary to know all about all. One ought to act in such cases with the generosity of a gentleman, conduct worthy of a gallant man. To overlook forms a large part of the work of ruling. Most things must be left unnoticed among relatives and friends, and even among enemies. All superfluity is annoying, especially in things that annoy. To keep hovering around the object of your annoyance is a kind of mania. Generally speaking, every man behaves according to his heart and his understanding. 89. Know Yourself In talents and capacity, in judgment and inclination, you cannot master yourself unless you know yourself. There are mirrors for the face, but none for the mind. Let careful thought about yourself serve as a substitute. When the outer image is forgotten, keep the inner one to improve and perfect. Learn the force of your intellect and capacity for affairs. Test the force of your courage in order to apply it, and keep your foundation secure and your head clear for everything. 80. The Secret of Long Life Lead a Good Life Two things bring life speedily to an end, folly and immorality. Some lose their life because they have not the intelligence to keep it, others because they have not the will. Just as virtue is its own reward, so is vice its own punishment. He who lives a fast life runs through life in a double sense. A virtuous life never dies. The firmness of the soul is communicated to the body, and a good life is long, not only in intention, but also in extension. End of section 11section 12 of the art of worldly wisdom this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda sonrisa survision.org the art of worldly wisdom by baltasar gracian translated by joseph jacobs section 12 91. 
never set to work at anything if you have any doubts of its prudence. A suspicion of failure in the mind of the doer is proof positive of it in that of the onlooker, especially if he is a rival. If in the heat of action your judgment feels scruples, it will afterwards, in cool reflection, condemn it as a piece of folly. Action is dangerous where prudence is in doubt. Better leave such things alone. Wisdom does not trust to probabilities. It always marches in the midday light of reason. How can an enterprise succeed, which the judgment condemns as soon as conceived? And if resolutions passed nem con by inner court often turn out unfortunately, what can we expect of those undertaken by a doubting reason and a vacillating judgment? 92. Transcendent Wisdom I mean in everything. The first and highest rule of all deed and speech, the more necessary to be followed, the higher and more numerous our posts, is an ounce of wisdom is worth more than tons of cleverness. It is the only sure way, though it may not gain so much applause. The reputation of wisdom is the last triumph of fame. It is enough if you satisfy the wise, for their judgment is the touchstone of true success. 93. Versatility. A man of many excellences equals many men. By imparting his own enjoyment of life to his circle, he enriches their life. Variety in excellences is the delight of life. It is a great art to profit by all that is good, and since nature has made man in his highest development an abstract of herself, so let art create in him a true microcosm by training his taste and intellect. 94. Keep the extent of your abilities unknown. The wise man does not allow his knowledge and abilities to be sounded to the bottom if he desires to be honored by all. He allows you to know them, but not to comprehend them. No one must know the extent of his abilities, lest he be disappointed. No one ever has an opportunity of fathoming him entirely, for guesses and doubts about the extent of his talents arouse more veneration than accurate knowledge of them. Be they ever so great. 95. Keep expectation alive. Keep stirring it up. Let much promise more, and great deeds herald greater. Do not rest your whole fortune on a single cast of the die. It requires great skill to moderate your forces so as to keep expectation from being dissipated. 96. The Highest Discretion it is the throne of reason, the foundation of prudence. By its means success is gained at little cost. It is a gift from above, and should be prayed for as the first and best quality. Tis the main piece of the panoply, and so important, that its absence makes a man imperfect, whereas with other qualities it is merely a question of more or less. All the actions of life depend on its application, all require its assistance, for everything needs intelligence. Discretion consists in a natural tendency to the most rational course, combined with a liking for the surest. 97. Obtain and preserve a reputation. It is the usufruct of fame. It is expensive to obtain a reputation, for it only attaches to distinguished abilities, which are as rare as mediocrities are common. Once obtained, it is easily preserved. It confers many an obligation, but it does more. When it is owing to elevated powers or lofty spheres of action, it rises to a kind of veneration and yields a sort of majesty. But it is only a well-founded reputation that lasts permanently. 98. Write your intentions in cipher. The passions are the gates of the soul. The most practical knowledge consists in disguising them. He that plays with cards exposed runs a risk of losing the stakes. The reserve of caution should combat the curiosity of inquirers. Adopt the policy of the cuttlefish. Do not even let your tastes be known, lest others utilize them, either by running counter to them or by flattering them. 
99. Reality and Appearance Things pass for what they seem, not for what they are. Few see inside. Many take to the outside. It is not enough to be right, if right seem false and ill. 100. A man without illusions, a wise Christian, a philosophic courtier. Be all these, not merely seem to be them, still less affect to be them. Philosophy is nowadays discredited, but yet it was always the chiefest concern of the wise. The art of thinking has lost all its former repute. Seneca introduced it at Rome. It went to court for some time, but now it is considered out of place there. And yet the discovery of deceit was always thought the true nourishment of a thoughtful mind, the true delight of a virtuous soul. End of section 12section 13 the art of worldly wisdom this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer visit librivox.org recorded by linda sonrisa servision.org the art of worldly wisdom by baltasar gracian translated by joseph jacobs Section 13 101. One half of the world laughs at the other, and fools are they all. Everything is good or everything is bad according to the votes they gain. What one pursues, another persecutes. He is an insufferable ass that would regulate everything according to his ideas. Excellences do not depend on a single man's pleasure. So many men, so many tastes, all different. There is no defect which is not affected by some, nor need we lose heart if things please not some, for others will appreciate them, nor need their applause turn our head, for there will be surely others to condemn. The real test of praise is the approbation of famous men and of experts in the matter. You should aim to be independent of any one vote, of any one fashion, of any one century. 102. Be able to stomach big slices of luck. In the body of wisdom not the least important organ is a big stomach, for great capacity implies great parts. Big bits of luck do not embarrass one who can digest still bigger ones. What is a surfeit for one may be hunger for another. Many are troubled as it were with weak digestion, owing to their small capacity being neither born nor trained for great employment. Their actions turn sour, and the humors that arise from their undeserved honors turn their head, and they incur great risks in high place. They do not find their proper place, for luck finds no proper place in them. A man of talent, therefore, should know that he has more room for even greater enterprises, and above all, avoid showing signs of a little heart. 103. Let each keep up his dignity. Let each deed of a man in its degree, though he be not a king, be worthy of a prince, and let his action be princely within due limits. Sublime in action, lofty in thought, in all things like a king, at least in merit, if not in might. For true kingship lies in spotless rectitude, and he need not envy greatness who can serve as a model of it. Especially should those near the throne Aim at true superiority, and prefer to share the true qualities of royalty, rather than take parts in its mere ceremonies, yet without affecting its imperfections, but sharing in its true dignity. 104. Try your hand at office. It requires varied qualities, and to know which is needed taxes attention and calls for masterly discernment. Some demand courage, others tact. Those that merely require rectitude are the easiest, the most difficult those requiring cleverness. For the former all that is necessary is character. For the latter all one's attention and zeal may not suffice. Tis a troublesome business to rule men, still more fools or blockheads. Double sense is needed with those who have none. 
it is intolerable when an office engrosses a man with fixed hours and a settled routine those are better that leave a man free to follow his own devices combining variety with importance for the change refreshes the mind the most in repute are those that have least or most distant dependence on others the worst is that which worries us both here and hereafter 105 don't be a bore the man of one business or of one topic is apt to be heavy brevity flatters and does better business it gains by courtesy what it loses by curtness good things when short are twice as good the quintessence of the matter is more effective than a whole farrago of details it is a well-known truth that talkative folk rarely have much sense whether in dealing with the matter itself or its formal treatment there are that serve more for stumbling stones than centerpieces useless lumber in every one's way the wise avoid being bores especially to the great who are fully occupied it is worse to disturb one of them than all the rest well said is soon said 106 do not parade your position to outshine in dignity is more offensive than in personal attractions to pose as a personage is to be hated envy is surely enough the more you seek esteem the less you obtain it for it depends on the opinion of others you cannot take it but must earn and receive it from others great positions require an amount of authority sufficient to make them efficient without it they cannot be adequately filled preserve therefore enough dignity to carry on the duties of the office do not enforce respect but try and create it those who insist on the dignity of their office show they have not deserved it and that it is too much for them if you wish to be valued be valued for your talents not for anything adventitious even kings prefer to be honored for their personal qualifications rather than for their station 107 show no self-satisfaction you must neither be discontented with yourself and that were poor spirited nor self-satisfied and that is folly self-satisfaction arises mostly from ignorance it would be a happy ignorance not without its advantages if it did not injure our credit because a man cannot achieve the superlative perfections of others he contents himself with any mediocre talent of his own distrust is wise and even useful either to evade mishaps or to afford consolation when they come for a misfortune cannot surprise a man who has already feared it even homer nods at times and alexander fell from his lofty state and out of his illusions things depend on many circumstances what constitutes triumph in one set may cause a defeat in another in the midst of all incorrigible folly remains the same with empty self-satisfaction blossoming flowering and running all to seed 108 the path to greatness is along with others intercourse works well manners and taste are shared good sense and even talent grow insensibly let the sanguine man then make a comrade of the lymphatic and so with the other temperaments so that without any forcing the golden mean is obtained it is a great art to agree with others the alternation of contraries beautifies and sustains the world if it can cause harmony in the physical world still more can it do so in the moral adopt this policy in the choice of friends and defendants by joining extremes the more effective middle way is found 109 be not censorious there are men of gloomy character who regard everything as faulty not from any evil motive but because it is their nature to they condemn all these for what they have done those for what they will do this indicates a nature worse than cruel vile indeed they accuse with such exaggeration that they make out of motes beams wherewith to force out the eyes they are always taskmasters who could turn a paradise into a prison if passion intervenes they drive matters to the extreme a noble nature on the contrary always knows 
how to find an excuse for failings, if not in the intention, at least from oversight. 110. Do not wait till you are a sinking sun. Tis a maxim of the wise to leave things before things leave them. One should be able to snatch a triumph at the end, just as the sun, even at its brightest, often retires behind a cloud, so as not to be seen sinking, and to leave in doubt whether he has sunk or no. Wisely withdraw from the chance of mishaps, lest you have to do so from the reality. Do not wait till they turn you the cold shoulder, and carry you to the grave, alive in feeling, but dead in esteem. Wise trainers put racers to grass, before they arouse derision, by falling on the course. A beauty should break her mirror early, lest she do so later with open eyes. End of section 13section 14 the art of worldly wisdom this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer visit librivox.org recording by linda sonrisa servision.org the art of worldly wisdom by baltasar gracian section 14 111 have friends. Tis a second existence. Every friend is good and wise for his friend. Among them all everything turns to good. Every one is as others wish him, that they may wish him well. He must win their hearts and so their tongues. There is no magic like a good turn, and the way to gain friendly feelings is to do friendly acts. The most and best of us depend on others. We have to live either among friends or among enemies. Seek someone every day to be a well-wisher, if not a friend. By and by, after trial, some of these will become intimate. 112. Gain Goodwill For thus the first and highest cause foresees and furthers the greatest objects. By gaining their goodwill you gain men's good opinion. Some trust so much to merit that they neglect grace. But wise men know that service road without a lift from favor is a long way indeed. Goodwill facilitates and supplies everything. It supposes gifts or even supplies them, as courage, zeal, knowledge, or even discretion, whereas defects it will not see because it does not search for them. It arises from some common interest, either material, as disposition, nationality, relationship, fatherland, office, or formal, which is a higher kind of communion, incapacity, obligation, reputation, or merit. The whole difficulty is to gain goodwill. To keep it is easy. It has, however, to be sought for, and when found, to be utilized. 113. In prosperity, prepare for adversity. It is both wiser and easier to collect winter stores in summer. In prosperity favors are cheap, and friends are many. Tis well, therefore, to keep them for more unlucky days, for adversity costs dear and has no helpers. Retain a store of friendly and obliged persons. The day may come when their price will go up. Low minds never have friends. In luck they will not recognize them, in misfortune they will not be recognized by them. 14. Never compete. Every competition damages the credit. Our rivals seize occasion to obscure us so as to outshine us. Few wage honorable war. Rivalry discloses faults which courtesy would hide. Many have lived in good repute while they had no rivals. The heat of conflict gives life, or even new life, to dead scandals and digs up long buried skeletons. Competition begins with the belittling and seeks aid wherever it can, not only where it ought. And when the weapons of abuse do not affect their purpose, as often or mostly happens, our opponents use them for revenge, and use them at least for beating away the dust of oblivion from anything to our discredit. Men of goodwill are always at peace. Men of good repute and dignity 
are men of good will. 15. Get used to the failings of your familiars. As you do to ugly faces, it is indispensable if they depend on us or we on them. There are wretched characters with whom one cannot live, yet not without them. Therefore clever folks get used to them as to ugly faces, so that they are not obliged to do so suddenly under the pressure of necessity. At first they arouse disgust, but gradually they lose this influence, and reflection provides for disgust, or puts up with it. 16. Only act with honorable men. You can trust them, and they you. Their honor is the best surety of their behavior, even in misunderstandings, for they always act having regard to what they are. Hence tis better to have a dispute with honorable people than to have a victory over dishonorable ones. You cannot treat with the ruined, for they have no hostages for rectitude. With them there is no true friendship, and their agreements are not binding, however stringent they may appear, because they have no feeling of honor. Never have to do with such men, for if honor does not restrain a man, virtue will not, since honor is the throne of rectitude. 17. Never talk of yourself. You must either praise yourself, which is vain, or blame yourself, which is little-minded. It ill beseems him that speaks, and ill pleases him that hears. And if you should avoid this in ordinary conversation, how much more in official matters, and above all in public speaking, where every appearance of unwisdom really is unwise. The same want of tact lies in speaking of a man in his presence, owing to the danger of going to one of two extremes, flattery or censure. 18. Acquire the reputation of courtesy, for it is enough to make you liked. Politeness is the main ingredient of culture, a kind of witchery that wins the regard of all as surely as discourtesy gains their disfavor and opposition. If this latter springs from pride, it is abominable, and if from bad breeding, it is despicable. Better too much courtesy than too little, provided it be not the same for all, which degenerates into injustice. Between opponents it is especially due as a proof of valor. It costs little and helps much. Every one is honored who gives honor. Politeness and honor have this advantage, that they remain with him who displays them to others. 19. Avoid becoming disliked. There is no occasion to seek dislike. It comes without seeking quickly enough. There are many who hate of their own accord without knowing the why or the how. Their ill will outruns our readiness to please. Their ill nature is more prone to do others harm than their cupidity is eager to gain advantage for themselves. Some manage to be on bad terms with all because they always either produce or experience vexation of spirit. Once hate has taken root, it is, like bad repute, difficult to eradicate. Wise men are feared, the malevolent are abhorred, the arrogant are regarded with disdain, buffoons with contempt, eccentrics with neglect. Therefore, pay respect that you may be respected, and know that to be esteemed you must show esteem. 120. Live practically. Even knowledge has to be in the fashion and where it is not, it is wise to affect ignorance. Thought and taste change with the times. Do not be old-fashioned in your ways of thinking, and let your taste be in the modern style. In everything, the taste of the many carries the votes. For the time being, one must follow it in the hope of leading it to higher things. In the adornment of the body as of the mind, adapt yourself to the present, even though the past appear better. But this rule does not apply to kindness, for goodness is for all time. It is neglected nowadays and seems out of date. Truth speaking, keeping your word, and so too good people, seem to come from the good old times. Yet they are liked for all that, but in such a way that even when they all exist, they are not in the fashion 
and are not imitated. What a misfortune for our age that it regards virtue as a stranger and vice as a matter of course. If you are wise, live as you can. If you cannot, live as you would. Think more highly of what fate has given you than of what it has denied. End of section 14 Section 15 of The Art of Worldly Wisdom. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Sonrisa, SirVision.org. The Art of Worldly Wisdom by Baltasar Gracian. Translated by Joseph Jacobs. Section 15. 121. Do not make a business of what is no business. As some make gossip out of everything, so others business. They always talk big, take everything in earnest, and turn it into a dispute or secret. Troublesome things must not be taken too seriously if they can be avoided. It is preposterous to take to heart that which you should throw over your shoulders. Much that would be something has become nothing by being left alone, and what was nothing has become of consequence by being made much of. At the outset things can be easily settled, but not afterwards. Often the remedy causes the disease. Tis by no means the least of life's rules to let things alone. 122. Distinction in Speech and Action by this you gain a position in many places and carry esteem beforehand. It shows itself in everything, in talk, in look, even in gait. It is a great victory to conquer men's hearts. It does not arise from any foolish presumption or pompous talk, but in a becoming tone of authority born of superior talent combined with true merit. 123. Avoid Affectation the more merit, the less affectation, which gives a vulgar flavor to all. It is wearisome to others, and troublesome to the one affected, for he becomes a martyr to care, and tortures himself with attention. The most eminent merits lose most by it, for they appear proud and artificial, instead of being the product of nature, and the natural is always more pleasing than the artificial. One always feels sure that the man who affects a virtue has it not. The more pains you take with the thing, the more should you conceal them, so that it may appear to arise spontaneously from your own natural character. Do not, however, in avoiding affectation, fall into it by affecting to be unaffected. The sage never seems to know his own merits, for only by not noticing them can you call others' attention to them. He is twice great, who has all the perfections in the opinions of all except of himself. He attains applause by two opposite paths. 124. Get yourself missed. Few reach such favor with the many. If with the wise, tis the height of happiness. When one has finished one's work, coldness is the general rule. But there are ways of earning this reward of goodwill. The sure way is to excel in your office and talents. Add to this agreeable manner, and you reach the point where you become necessary to your office, not your office to you. Some do honor to their post, with others tis the other way. It is no great gain if a poor successor makes the predecessor seem good, for this does not imply that the one is missed, but that the other is wished away. 125. Do not be a blacklist. It is a sign of having a tarnished name to concern oneself with the ill fame of others. Some wish to hide their own stains with those of others, or at least wash them away, or they seek consolation therein. Tis the consolation of fools. They must have bad breath who form the sewers of scandal for the whole town. The more one grubs about in such matters, the more one befouls oneself. There are few without stain, somewhere or other. 
but it is of little known people that the failings are little known be careful then to avoid being a registrar of faults that is to be an abominable thing a man that lives without a heart 126 folly consists not in committing folly but in not hiding it when committed you should keep your desires sealed up still more your defects all go wrong sometimes but the wise try to hide the errors but fools boast of them reputation depends more on what is hidden than on what is done if a man does not live chastely he must live cautiously the errors of great men are like the eclipses of the greater lights even in friendship it is rare to expose one's failings to one's friend nay one should conceal them from oneself if one can but here one can help with that other great rule of life learn to forget 127 grace in everything tis the life of talents the breath of speech the soul of action and the ornament of ornament perfections are the adornment of our nature but this is the adornment of perfection itself it shows itself even in the thoughts tis most a gift of nature and owes least to education it even triumphs over training it is more than ease approaches the free and easy gets over embarrassment and adds the finishing touch to perfection without it beauty is lifeless graciousness ungraceful it surpasses valor discretion prudence even majesty itself tis a short way to dispatch and an easy escape from embarrassment 128 high-mindedness one of the principal qualifications for a gentleman for it spurs on to all kinds of nobility it improves the taste ennobles the heart elevates the mind refines the feelings and intensifies dignity it raises him in whom it is found and at times remedies the bad turns of fortune which only raises by striking it can find full scope in the will when it cannot be exercised in act magnanimity generosity and all heroic qualities recognize in it their source 129 never complain to complain always brings discredit better be a model of self-reliance opposed to the passion of others than an object of their compassion for it opens the way for the hearer to what we are complaining of and to disclose one insult forms an excuse for another by complaining of past offenses we give occasion for future ones and in seeking aid or counsel we only obtain indifference or contempt it is much more politic to praise one man's favors so that others may feel obliged to follow suit to recount the favors we owe the absent is to demand similar ones from the present and thus we sell our credit with the one to the other the shrewd will therefore never publish to the world his failures or his defects but only those marks of consideration which serve to keep friendship alive and enmity silent 130 do and be seen doing things do not pass for what they are but for what they seem to be of use and to know how to show yourself of use is to be twice as useful what is not seen is as if it was not even the right does not receive proper consideration if it does not seem right the observant are far fewer in number than those who are deceived by appearances deceit rules the roast and things are judged by their jackets and many things are other than they seem a good exterior is the best recommendation of the inner perfection end of section 15 section 16 of the art of worldly wisdom this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. The Art of Worldly Wisdom by Balthasar Gratian 
Translated by Joseph Jacobs. Section 16. 131. Nobility of Feeling. There is a certain distinction of the soul, a high-mindedness prompting to gallant acts, that gives an air of grace to the whole character. It is not found often, for it presupposes great magnanimity. Its chief characteristic is to speak well of an enemy, and to act even better towards him. It shines brightest when a chance comes of revenge. Not alone does it let the occasion pass, but it improves it by using a complete victory in order to display unexpected generosity. Tis a fine stroke of policy, nay, the very acme of statecraft. It makes no pretense to victory, for it pretends to nothing, and, while obtaining its deserts, it conceals its merits. 132. Revise Your Judgments To appeal to an inner court of revision makes things safe. Especially when the course of action is not clear, you gain time either to confirm or improve your decision. It affords new grounds for strengthening or corroborating your judgment. And, if it is a matter of giving, the gift is the more valued from its being evidently well considered than for being promptly bestowed. Long expected is highest prized. And if you have to deny, you gain time to decide how and when to mature the no, that it may be made palatable. Besides, after the first heat of desire is past, the repulse of refusal is felt less keenly in cold blood. But especially when men press for a reply, is it best to defer it, for as often as not that is only a feint to disarm a tension. 133. Better mad with the rest of the world than wise alone. So say politicians. If all are so, one is no worse off than the rest, whereas solitary wisdom passes for folly. So important is it to sail with the stream. The greatest wisdom often consists in ignorance or the pretense of it. One has to live with others, and others are mostly ignorant. To live entirely alone, one must be very like a god, or quite like a wild beast. But I would turn the aphorism by saying, Better be wise with the many than a fool all alone. There may be some, too, who seek to be original by seeking chimeras. 134. Double Your Resources you thereby double your life. One must not depend on one thing or trust to only one resource, however preeminent. Everything should be kept double, especially the causes of success, of favor, or of esteem. The moon's mutability transcends everything and gives a limit to all existence, especially of things dependent on human will the most brittle of all things. To guard against this inconstancy should be the sage's care, and for this the chief rule of life is to keep a double store of good and useful qualities. Thus, as nature gives us in duplicate the most important of our limbs and those most exposed to risk, so art should deal with the qualities on which we depend for success. 135. Do not nourish the spirit of contradiction. It only proves you foolish or peevish, and prudence should guard against this strenuously. To find difficulties in everything may prove you clever, but such wrangling writes you down a fool. Such folk make a mimic war out of the most pleasant conversation, and in this way act as enemies towards their associates, rather than towards those with whom they do not consort. 
grit grates most in delicacies, and so does contradiction in amusement. They are both foolish and cruel who yoke together the wild beast and the tame. 136. Post yourself in the center of things, so you feel the pulse of affairs. Many lose their way either in the ramifications of useless discussion or in the brushwood of wearisome verbosity without ever realizing the real matter at issue. They go over a single point a hundred times, wearing themselves and others, and yet never touch the all-important center or affairs. This comes from a confusion of mind from which they cannot extricate themselves. They waste time and patience on matters they should leave alone, and cannot spare them afterwards for what they have left alone. 137. The sage should be self-sufficing. He that was all in all to himself carried all with him when he carried himself. If a universal friend can represent to us Rome and the rest of the world, let a man be his own universal friend, and then he is in a position to live alone. Whom could such a man want if there is no clearer intellect or finer taste than his own? He would then depend on himself alone, which is the highest happiness and like the supreme being. He that can live alone resembles the brute beast in nothing, the sage in much, and God in everything. 138. The Art of Letting Things Alone the more so the wilder the waves of public or of private life. There are hurricanes in human affairs, tempests of passion, when it is wise to retire to a harbour and ride at anchor. Remedies often make diseases worse. In such cases, one has to leave them to their natural course and the moral suasion of time. It takes a wise doctor to know when not to prescribe, and at times the greater skill consists in not applying remedies. The proper way to still the storms of the vulgar is to hold your hand and let them calm down of themselves. To give way now is to conquer by and by. A fountain gets muddy with but little stirring up, and does not get clear by our meddling with it, but by our leaving it alone. The best remedy for disturbances is to let them run their course, for so they quiet down. 139. Recognize unlucky days. They exist. Nothing goes well on them, even though the game may be changed, the ill luck remains. Two tries should be enough to tell if one is in luck today or not. Everything is in process of change, even the mind, and no one is always wise. Chance has something to say, even how to write a good letter. All perfection turns on the time, even beauty has its hours. Even wisdom fails at times by doing too much or too little. To turn out well, a thing must be done on its own day. This is why, with some, everything turns out ill, with others all goes well, even with less trouble. They find everything ready, their wit prompt, their presiding genius favorable, their lucky star in the ascendant. At such times one must seize the occasion and not throw away the slightest chance. But a shrewd person will not decide on the day's luck by a single piece of good or bad fortune, for the one may be only a lucky chance and the other only a slight annoyance. 140. Find the good in a thing at once. 
tis the advantage of good taste the bee goes to the honey for her comb the serpent to the gall for its venom so with taste some seek the good others the ill there is nothing that has no good in it especially in books as giving food for thought but many have such a scent that amid a thousand excellences they fix upon a single defect and single it out for blame as if they were the scavengers of men's minds and hearts so they draw up a balance sheet of defects which does more credit to their bad taste than to their intelligence they lead a sad life, nourishing themselves on bitters and battening on garbage. They have the luckier taste, who, midst a thousand defects, seize upon a single beauty they may have hit upon by chance. End of section 16 Section 17 of the Art of Worldly Wisdom. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Wayne Cook. The Art of Worldly Wisdom by Paldasar Gracian. Translated by Joseph Jacobs. Section 17. Number 141. Do Not Listen to Yourself. It is no use pleasing yourself if you do not please others, and as a rule, general contempt is the punishment for self-satisfaction. The attention you pay to yourself you probably owe to others. To speak and at the same time listen to yourself cannot turn out well. If to talk to oneself when alone is folly, it must be doubly unwise to listen to oneself in the presence of others. It is a weakness of the great to talk with the recurrent, as I was saying, and, eh, which bewilders their hearers. At every sentence they look for applause or flattery, taxing the patient of the wise. So, too, the pompous speak with an echo, and as their talk can only totter on with the aid of stilts, at every word they need the support of a stupid bravo. Number 142 never from obstinacy take the wrong side because your opponent has anticipated you in taking the right one you begin the fight already beaten and must soon take to flight in disgrace with bad weapons one can never win it was astute in the opponent to seize the better side first it would be folly to come lagging after with the worst such obstinacy is more dangerous in actions than in words for action encounters more risk than talk tis the common failing of the obstinate that they lose the true by contradicting it and the useful by quarrelling with it the sage never places himself on the side of passion but espouses the cause of right either discovering it first or improving it later if the enemy is a fool he will in such a case turn round to follow the opposite and worse way Thus, the only way to drive him from the better course is to take it yourself, for his folly will cause him to desert it, and his obstinacy be punished for so doing. Number 143. Never become paradoxical in order to avoid the trite. Both extremes damage our reputation. Every undertaking which differs from the reasonable approaches foolishness. The paradox is a cheat. It wins applause at first by its novelty and piquancy, but afterwards it becomes discredited when the deceit is foreseen and its emptiness becomes apparent. It is a species of jugglery, and in matters political would be the ruin of states. Those who cannot or dare not reach great deeds on the direct road of excellence go round by way of paradox, admired by fools but making wise men true prophets. It argues an unbalanced judgment, and if it is not altogether based on the false, it is certainly founded on the uncertain, and risks the weightier matters of life. Number 144. Begin another's 
to end with your own. Tis a politic means to your end. Even in heavenly matters, Christian teachers lay stress on this holy cunning. It is a weightier piece of dissimulation, for the foreseen advantages serve as a lure to influence the other's will. His affair seems to be in train when it is really only leading the way for another's. One should never advance unless under cover, especially where the ground is dangerous. Likewise, with persons who always say no at first, it is useful to ward off this blow, because the difficulty of conceding much more does not occur to them when your version is presented to them. This advice belongs to the rule about second thoughts, chapter 13, which covers the most subtle maneuvers of life. Number 145. Do not show your wounded finger, for everything will knock up against it, nor complain about it, for malice always aims where weakness can be injured. It is no use to be vexed, being the butt of the talk will only vex you the more. Ill will searches for wounds to irritate, aims darts to try the temper, and tries a thousand ways to sting to the quick. The wise never own to being hit, or disclose any evil, whether personal or hereditary. For even fate sometimes likes to wound us where we are most tender. It always mortifies wounded flesh. Never, therefore, disclose the source of mortification, or of joy, if you wish the one to cease, and the other to endure. Number 146. Look into the interior of things. Things are generally other than they seem, and ignorance that never looks beneath the rind becomes disabused when you show the kernel. Lies always come first, dragging fools along by their irreparable vulgarity. Truth always lags last, limping along on the arm of time. The wise, therefore, reserve for it the other half of that power which the common mother has widely given in duplicate. Deceit is very superficial, and the superficial therefore easily fall into it. Prudence lives retired within its recesses, visited only by sages and wise men. Number 147. Do not be inaccessible. None is so perfect that he does not need, at times, the advice of others. He is an incorrigible ass who will never listen to anyone. Even the most surpassing intellect should find a place for friendly counsel. Sovereignty itself must learn to lean. There are some that are incorrigible simply because they are inaccessible. They fall to ruin because none dares to extricate them. The highest should have the door open for friendship. It may prove the gate of help. A friend must be free to advise, and even to upbraid, without feeling embarrassed. Our satisfaction in him and our trust in his steadfast faith give him that power. One need not pay respect or give credit to everyone, but in the innermost of his precaution man has a true mirror of a confidant to whom he owes the correction of his errors, and has to thank for it. Number 148. Have the Art of Conversation. That is where the real personality shows itself. No act in life requires more attention, though it be the commonest thing in life. You must either lose or gain by it. If it needs care to write a letter, which is but a deliberate and written conversation, how much more the ordinary kind in which there is occasion for a prompt display of intelligence. Experts feel the pulse of the soul is the tongue, wherefore the sage said, Speak, that I may know thee. Some hold that the art of conversation is to be without art, that it should be neat, not gaudy, like the garments. This holds good for talk between friends, but when held with the person to whom one would show respect, it should be more dignified to answer to the dignity of the person addressed. To be appropriate, it should adapt itself to the mind and tone of the interlocutor. 
and do not be a critic of words or you will be taken for pedant nor a tax-gatherer of ideas or men will avoid you or at least sell their thoughts dear in conversation discretion is more important than eloquence number one hundred forty nine know how to put off ills on others to have a shield against ill will is a great piece of skill in a ruler it is not the resort of incapacity as ill-wishers imagine but is due to the higher policy of having someone to receive the censure of the disaffected and the punishment of universal detestation everything cannot turn out well nor can every one be satisfied it is well therefore even at the cost of our pride to have such a scapegoat such a target for unlucky undertakings number 150 know to get your price for things their intrinsic value is not sufficient for all do not bite at the kernel or look into the interior most go with the crowd and go because they see others go it is a great stroke of art to bring things into repute at times by praising them for praise arouses desire at times by giving them a striking name which is very useful for putting things at a premium provided it is done without affectation again it is generally an inducement to profess to supply only connoisseurs for all think themselves such and if not the sense of want arouses the desire never call things easy or common that makes them depreciated rather than made accessible all rush after the unusual which is more appetizing both for the taste and for the intelligence end of section 17 Section 18 of The Art of Worldly Wisdom. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tina Ding. The Art of Worldly Wisdom by Bartasar Grisian. Translated by Joseph Jacobs. 151 think beforehand today for tomorrow and even for many days hence the greatest foresight consists in determining beforehand the time of trouble for the provident there are no mischances and for the careful no narrow escapes we must not put off thought till we're up to the chin in mire mature reflection can get over the most formidable difficulty the pillow is a silent sibyl, and it is better to sleep on things beforehand than lie awake about them afterwards. Many act first and then think afterwards, that is, they think less of consequences than of excuses. Others think neither before nor after. The whole of life should be one course of thought how not to miss the right path. Rumination and foresight enable one to determine the line of life. 152. Never have a companion who casts you in the shade. The more he does so, the less desirable a companion he is. The more he excels in quality, the more in repute. He will always play first fiddle and you second. If you get any consideration, it is only his leavings. The moon shines bright alone among the stars. When the sun rises, she becomes either invisible or imperceptible. Never join one that eclipses you, but rather one who sets you in a brighter light. By this means, the cunning fabula in Marshall was able to appear beautiful and brilliant, owing to the ugliness and disorder of her companions. But one should as little imperil oneself by an evil companion as pay honor to another at the cost of one's own credit. When you are on the way to fortune, associate with the eminent. When arrived, with the mediocre. 153. Beware of entering where there is a great gap to be filled. But if you do it, be sure to surpass your predecessor. Merely to equal him requires twice his worth. 
as it is a fine stroke to arrange that our successor shall cause us to be wished back, so it is policy to see that our predecessor does not eclipse us. To fill a great gap is difficult, for the past always seems best, and to equal the predecessor is not enough, since he has the right of first possession. You must, therefore, possess additional claims to oust the other from his hold on public opinion. 154. Do not believe or like lightly. Maturity of mind is best shown in slow belief. Lying is the usual thing, then let belief be unusual. He that is lightly led away soon falls into contempt. At the same time, there is no necessity to betray your doubts in the good faith of others, for this adds insult to discourtesy, since you make out your informant to be either deceiver or deceived. Nor is this the only evil. Want of belief is the mark of the liar, who suffers from two failings. He neither believes nor is believed. Suspension of judgment is prudent in a hearer. The speaker can appeal to his original source of information. There is a similar kind of imprudence in liking too easily, for lies may be told by deeds as well as in words, and this deceit is more dangerous for practical life. 155. The Art of Getting into a Passion If possible, oppose vulgar importunity with prudent reflection. It will not be difficult for a really prudent man. The first step towards getting into a passion is to announce that you are in a passion. By this means you begin the conflict with command over your temper, for one has to regulate one's passion to the exact point that is necessary and no further. This is the art of arts in falling into and getting out of a rage. You should know how and when best to come to a stop. It is most difficult to halt while running at a double. It is a great proof of wisdom to remain clear-sighted during paroxysms of rage. Every excess of passion is a digression from rational conduct. but. By this masterly policy, reason will never be transgressed, nor pass the bounds of its own synteresis. To keep control of passion, one must hold firm the reins of attention. He who can do so will be the first man, wise on horseback, and probably the last. 156. Select your friends. Only after passing the matriculation of experience and the examination of fortune will they be graduates not alone in a faction, but in discernment. Though this is the most important thing in life, it is the one least cared for. Intelligence brings friends to some, chance to most. Yet a man is judged by his friends, for there was never agreement between wise men and fools. At the same time, to find pleasure in a man's society is no proof of near friendship. It may come from the pleasantness of his company more than from trust in his capacity. There are some friendships legitimate, others illicit. The latter for pleasure, the former for their fecundity of ideas and motives. Few are the friends of a man's self, most those of his circumstances. The insight of a true friend is more useful than the goodwill of others. Therefore, gain them by choice, not by chance. A wise friend words off worries, a foolish one brings them about but do not wish them too much luck, or you may lose them. 157. Do not make mistakes about character. That is the worst and yet easiest error. Better be cheated in the price than in the quality of goods. In dealing with men, 
More than with other things, it is necessary to look within. To know men is different from knowing things. It is profound philosophy to sound the depths of feeling and distinguish traits of character. Men must be studied as deeply as books. One fifty-eight. Make use of your friends. This requires all the art of discretion. Some are good afar off, some when near. Many are no good at conversation, but excellent as correspondents. For distance removes some failings which are unbearable in close proximity to them. Friends are for use even more than for pleasure, for they have the three qualities of the good, or as some say, of being in general, unity, goodness, and truth. For a friend is all in all. Few are worthy to be good friends, and even these become fewer because men do not know how to pick them out. To keep is more important than to make friends. Select those that will wear well. If they are new at first, it is some consolation they will become old. Absolutely, the best are those well salted, though they may require soaking in the testing. There is no desert like living without friends. Friendship multiplies the good of life and divides the evil. Tis the sole remedy against misfortune, the very ventilation of the soul. One fifty nine, put up with fools. The wise are always impatient, for he that increases knowledge increases impatience of folly. Much knowledge is difficult to satisfy. The first great rule of life, according to Epictetus, is to put up with things. He makes that the moiety of wisdom. To put up with all the varieties of folly would need much patience. We often have to put up with most from those on whom we most depend. A useful lesson in self-control. Out of patience. Comes forth peace, the priceless boon which is the happiness of the world. But let him that hath no power of patience retire within himself, though even there he will have to put up with himself. One sixty, be careful in speaking with your rivals from prudence, with others for the sake of appearance. There is always time to add a word. Never to withdraw one. Talk as if you were making your will. The fewer words, the less litigation. In trivial matters, exercise yourself for the more weighty matters of speech. Profound secrecy has some of the luster of the divine. He who speaks lightly soon falls or fails. End of section eighteen. Section nineteen of the Art of Worldly Wisdom. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tina Ding. The Art of Worldly Wisdom by Bartasar Gracian, translated by Joseph Jacobs. One sixty one. Know your pet faults. The most perfect of men has them, and is either wedded to them or has illicit relations with them. They are often faults of intellect, and the greater this is, the greater they are, or at least the more conspicuous. It is not so much that their possessor does not know them; he loves them, which is a double evil. Your rational affection for avoidable faults. They are spots on perfection. They displease the onlooker as much as they please the possessor. Tis a gallant thing to get clear of them, and so give play to one's other qualities. For all men hit upon such a failing, and on going over your qualifications, they make a long stay at this blot and blacken it as deeply as possible. In order to cast your other talents into the shade, 
162. How to triumph over rivals and detractors. It is not enough to despise them, though this is often wise. A gallant bearing is the thing. One cannot praise a man too much who speaks well of them who speak ill of him. There is no more heroic vengeance than that of talents and services, which at once conquer and torment the envious. Every success is a further twist of the cord round the neck of the ill-affected, and an enemy's glory is the rival's hell. The envious die not once, but as oft as the envied wins applause. The immortality of his fame is the measure of the other's torture. The one lives in endless honor, the other in endless pain. The clarion of fame announces immortality to the one and death to the other, the slow death of envy long drawn out. 163. Never, from sympathy with the unfortunate, involve yourself in his fate. One man's misfortune is another man's luck, for one cannot be lucky without many being unlucky. It is a peculiarity of the unfortunate to arouse people's goodwill, who desire to compensate them for the blows of fortune with their useless favor, and it happens that one who is abhorred by all in prosperity is adored by all in adversity. Vengeance on the wing is exchanged for compassion afoot, yet tis to be noticed how fate shuffles the cards. There are men who always consort with the unlucky, and he that yesterday flew high and happy stands today miserable at their side. That argues nobility of soul, but not worldly wisdom. 164. Throw straws in the air to find how things will be received, especially those whose reception or success is doubtful. One can thus be assured of its turning out well, and an opportunity is afforded for going on in earnest, or withdrawing entirely. By trying men's intentions in this way, the wise man knows on what ground he stands. This is the great rule of foresight in asking, in desiring, and in ruling. 165. Wage War Honorably you may be obliged to wage war, but not to use poisoned arrows. Everyone must needs act as he is, not as others would make him to be. Gallantry in the battle of life wins all men's praise. One should fight so as to conquer, not alone by force, but by the way it is used. A mean victory brings no glory, but rather disgrace. Honor always has the upper hand. An honorable man never uses forbidden weapons, such as using a friendship that's ended for the purpose of a hatred just begun. A confidence must never be used for a vengeance. The slightest taint of treason tarnishes the good name. In men of honor, the smallest trace of meanness repels. The noble and the ignoble should be miles apart. Be able to boast that if gallantry, generosity, and fidelity were lost in the world, men would be able to find them again in your own breast. 166. Distinguish the men of words from the men of deeds. Discrimination here is as important as in the case of friends, persons, and employments, which have all many varieties. Bad words, even without bad deeds, are bad enough. Good words with bad deeds are worse. One cannot dine off words, which are wind, nor off politeness, which is but polite deceit. To catch birds with a mirror is the ideal snare. It is the vain alone who take their wages in windy words. Words should be the pledges of work, and, like pawn tickets, 
half their market price. Trees that bear leaves but not fruit have usually no pith. Know them for what they are, of no use except for shade. 167. Know how to take your own part. In great crises, there is no better companion than a bold heart, and if it becomes weak, it must be strengthened from the neighboring parts. Worries die away before a man who asserts himself. One must not surrender to misfortune, or else it would become intolerable. Many men do not help themselves in their troubles, and double their weight by not knowing how to bear them. He that knows himself knows how to strengthen his weakness, and the wise man conquers everything, even the stars in their courses. 168. Do not indulge in the eccentricities of folly. Like vain, presumptuous, egotistical, untrustworthy, capricious, obstinate, fanciful, theatrical, whimsical, inquisitive, paradoxical, sectarian people, and all kinds of one-sided persons, they are all monstrosities of impertinence. All deformity of mind is more obnoxious than that of the body because it contravenes a higher beauty. Yet who can assist such a complete confusion of mind? Where self-control is wanting, there is no room for others' guidance. Instead of paying attention to other people's real derision, men of this kind blind themselves with the unfounded assumption of their imaginary applause. 169. Be more careful not to miss once than to hit a hundred times. No one looks at the blazing sun, all gaze when he is eclipsed. The common talk does not reckon what goes right, but what goes wrong. Evil report carries farther than any applause. Many men are not known to the world till they have left it. All the exploits of a man taken together are not enough to wipe out a single small blemish. Avoid, therefore, falling into error, seeing that ill will notices every error and no success. 170. In all things, keep something in reserve. Tis a sure means of keeping up your importance. A man should not employ all his capacity and power at once and on every occasion. Even in knowledge, there should be a rear guard so that your resources are doubled. One must always have something to resort to when there is fear of a defeat. The reserve is of more importance than the attacking force, for it is distinguished for valor and reputation. Prudence always sets to work with assurance of safety. In this matter, the pick and paradox holds good that the half is more than the whole. End of section 19. Section 20 of The Art of Worldly Wisdom. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Art of Worldly Wisdom by Balthazar Gratian, translated by Joseph Jacobs, section 20. 171. Waste Not Influence The great as friends are for great occasions. One should not make use of great confidence for little things, for that is to waste a favor. The sheet anchor should be reserved for the last extremity, if you use up the great for little ends, what remains afterwards? Nothing is more valuable than a protector, and nothing costs more nowadays than a favor. It can make or unmake a whole world. It can even give sense and take it away. As nature and fame are favorable to the wise, so luck is generally envious of them. It is, therefore, more important to keep the favor of the mighty than goods and chattels. 
172. Never contend with a man who has nothing to lose, for thereby you enter into an unequal conflict. The other enters without anxiety. Having lost everything, including shame, he has no further loss to fear. He, therefore, resorts to all kinds of insolence. One should never expose a valuable reputation to so terrible a risk, lest what has cost years to gain may be lost in a moment, since a single slight may wipe out much sweat. A man of honor and responsibility has a reputation because he has much to lose. He balances his own and the other's reputation. He only enters into the contest with the greatest caution, and then goes to work with such circumspection that he gives time to prudence to retire in time and bring his reputation under cover. For even by victory he cannot gain what he has lost by exposing himself to the chances of loss. 173. Do not be glass in intercourse, still less in friendship. Some break very easily, and thereby show their want of consistency. They attribute to themselves imaginary offences, and to others oppressive intentions. Their feelings are even more sensitive than the eye itself, and must not be touched in jest or in earnest. Motes offend them, they need not wait for beams. Those who consort with them must treat them with the greatest delicacy, have regard to their sensitiveness, and watch their demeanour, since the slightest slight arouses their annoyance. They are mostly very egoistic, slaves of their moods, for the sake of which they cast everything aside. They are the worshippers of punctilio. On the other hand, the disposition of the true lover is firm and enduring, so that it may be said that the amant is half adamant. 174. Do not live in a hurry. To know how to separate things is to know how to enjoy them. Many finish their fortune sooner than their life. They run through pleasures without enjoying them, and would like to go back when they find they have overleaped the mark. Postilions of life, they increase the ordinary pace of life by the hurry of their own calling. They devour more in one day than they can digest in a whole lifetime. They live in advance of pleasures, eat up the years beforehand, and, by their hurry, get through everything too soon. Even in the search for knowledge there should be moderation, lest we learn things better left unknown. We have more days to live through than pleasures. Be slow in enjoyment, quick at work. For men see work ended with pleasure, pleasure ended with regret. 175. A Solid Man One who is finds no satisfaction in those that are not. Tis a pitiable eminence that is not well founded. Not all are men that seem to be so. Some are sources of deceit. Impregnated by chimeras, they give birth to impositions. Others are like them so far that they take more pleasure in a lie because it promises much than in the truth because it performs little. But in the end these caprices come to a bad end for they have no solid foundation. Only truth can give true reputation, only reality can be of real profit. One deceit needs many others, and so the whole house is built in the air and must soon come to the ground. Unfounded things never reach old age.
They promise too much to be much trusted, just as that cannot be true which proves too much. 176. Have knowledge, or know those that have knowledge. Without intelligence, either one's own or another's, true life is impossible. But many do not know that they do not know, and many think they know when they know nothing. Failings of the intelligence are incorrigible, since those who do not know do not know themselves, and cannot, therefore, seek what they lack. Many would be wise if they did not think themselves wise. Thus it happens that though the oracles of wisdom are rare, they are rarely used. To seek advice does not lessen greatness or argue incapacity. On the contrary, to ask advice proves you are well advised. Take counsel with reason if you do not wish to court defeat. 177. Avoid familiarities in intercourse. Neither use them nor permit them. He that is familiar loses any superiority his influence gives him, and so loses respect. The stars keep their brilliance by not making themselves common. The divine demands decorum. Every familiarity breeds contempt. In human affairs, the more a man shows, the less he has. For in open communication, you communicate the failings that reserve might keep under cover. Familiarity is never desirable. With superiors, because it is dangerous. With inferiors, because it is unbecoming least of all with the common herd, who become insolent from sheer folly. They mistake favour shown them for need felt of them. Familiarity trenches on vulgarity. 178. Trust your heart, especially when it has been proved. Never deny it a hearing. It is a kind of house oracle that often foretells the most important. Many have perished because they feared their own heart, but of what use is it to fear it without finding a better remedy? Many are endowed by nature with a heart so true that it always warns them of misfortune and wards off its effects. It is unwise to seek evils unless you seek to conquer them. 179. Reticence is the seal of capacity. A breast without a secret is an open letter. Where there is a solid foundation, secrets can be kept profound. There are spacious cellars where things of moment may be hid. Reticence springs from self-control, and to control oneself in this is a true triumph. You must pay ransom to each you tell. The security of wisdom consists in temperance in the inner man. The risk that reticence runs lies in the cross-questioning of others, in the use of contradiction to worm out secrets, in the darts of irony. To avoid these, the prudent becomes more reticent than before. What must be done need not be said, and what must be said need not be done. 180. Never guide the enemy to what he has to do. The fool never does what the wise judge wise, because he does not follow up the suitable means. He that is discreet follows still less a plan laid out or even carried out by another. One has to discuss matters from both points of view. 
turn it over on both sides. Judgments vary. Let him that has not decided attend rather to what is possible than what is probable. End of section 20、section、21 21 of the Art of Worldly Wisdom. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Sonrisa, Servision.org. The Art of Worldly Wisdom by Baltasar Gracian. Translated by Joseph Jacobs. Section 21. 181. The truth, but not the whole truth. Nothing demands more caution than the truth. Tis the lancet of the heart. It requires as much to tell the truth as to conceal it. A single lie destroys a whole reputation for integrity. The deceit is regarded as treason, and the deceiver as a traitor, which is worse. Yet not all truths can be spoken, some for our own sake, Others for the sake of others. 182. A grain of boldness in everything. Tis an important piece of prudence. You must moderate your opinion of others so that you may not think so high of them as to fear them. The imagination should never yield to the heart. Many appear great till you know them personally, and then dealing with them does more to disillusionize than to raise esteem. No one o'ersteps the narrow bounds of humanity. All have their weaknesses, either in heart or head. Dignity gives apparent authority, which is rarely accompanied by personal power. For fortune often redresses the height of office by the inferiority of the holder. The imagination always jumps too soon and paints things in brighter colors than the real. It thinks things not as they are, but as it wishes them to be. Attentive experience disillusioned in the past soon corrects all that. Yet if wisdom should not be timorous, neither should folly be rash. And if self-reliance helps the ignorant, how much more are the brave and wise? 183. Do not hold your views too firmly. Every fool is fully convinced and every one fully persuaded is a fool. The more erroneous his judgment, the more firmly he holds it. Even in cases of obvious certainty, it is fine to yield. Our reasons for holding the view cannot escape notice. Our courtesy in yielding must be the more recognized. Our obstinacy loses more than our victory yields. That is not to champion truth, but rather rudeness. There be some heads of iron most difficult to turn. Add caprice to obstinacy, and the sum is a wearisome fool. Steadfastness should be for the will, not for the mind. Yet there are exceptions where one would fail twice, owning oneself wrong both in judgment and in the execution of it. 184. Do not be ceremonious. Even in a king, affectation in this was renowned for its eccentricity. To be punctilious is to be a bore, yet whole nations have this peculiarity. The garb of folly is woven out of such things. Such folk are worshippers of their own dignity, yet show how little it is justified, since they fear that the least thing can destroy it. It is right to demand respect but not to be considered a master of ceremonies. Yet it is true that a man to do without ceremonies must possess supreme qualities, neither affect nor despise etiquette. He cannot be great who is great at such little things. 185. Never stake your credit on a single cast. For if it miscarries, the damage is irreparable. It may easy happen that a man should fail once, especially at first. Circumstances are not always favorable. Hence they say, 
Every dog has his day. Always connect your second attempt with your first. Whether it succeed or fail, the first will redeem the second. Always have resort to better means and appeal to more resources. Things depend on all sorts of chances. That is why the satisfaction of success is so rare. 186. Recognize faults, however high placed. Integrity cannot mistake vice, even when clothed in brocade or perchance crowned with gold, but will not be able to hide its character for all that. Slavery does not lose its vileness, however it vaunt the nobility of its lord and master. Vices may stand in high place, but are low for all that. Men can see that many a great man has great faults, yet they do not see that he is not great because of them. The example of the great is so specious that it even glosses over viciousness, till it may so affect those who flatter it that they do not notice that what they gloss over in the great they abominate in the lower classes. 187. Do pleasant things yourself, unpleasant things through others. By the one course you gain good will, by the other you avoid hatred. A great man takes more pleasure in doing a favor than in receiving one. It is the privilege of his generous nature. One cannot easily cause pain to another without suffering pain, either from sympathy or from remorse. In high place one can only work by means of rewards and punishment. So grant the first yourself, inflict the other through others. Have someone against whom the weapons of discontent, hatred, and slander may be directed. For the rage of the mob is like that of a dog. Missing the cause of its pain, it turns to bite the whip itself, and though this is not the real culprit, it has to pay the penalty. 188. Be the bearer of praise. This increases our credit for good taste, since it shows that we have learnt elsewhere to know what is excellent, and hence how to prize it in the present company. It gives material for conversation and for imitation, and encourages praiseworthy exertions. We do homage besides, in a very delicate way, to the excellences before us. Others do the opposite. They accompany their talk with a sneer, and fancy they flatter those present by belittling the absent. This may serve them with superficial people, who do not notice how cunning it is to speak ill of every one to every one else. Many pursue the plan of valuing more highly the mediocrities of the day than the most distinguished exploits of the past. Let the cautious penetrate through these subtleties, and let him not be dismayed by the exaggerations of the one, or made overconfident by the flatteries of the other. Knowing that both act in the same way by different methods, adapting their talk to the company they are in. 189. Utilize another's wants. The greater his wants, the greater the turn of the screw. Philosophers say privation is non existent, statesmen say it is all embracing, and they are right. Many make ladders to attain their ends out of wants of others. They make use of the opportunity and tantalize the appetite by pointing out the difficulty of satisfaction. The energy of desire promises more than the inertia of possession. The passion of desire increases with every increase of opposition. It is a subtle point to satisfy the desire and yet preserve the dependence. 190. Find consolation in all things. Even the useless may find it in being immortal. No trouble without compensation. Fools are held to be lucky, and the good luck of the ugly is proverbial. Be worth little, and you will live long. It is the cracked glass that never gets broken, but worries one with its durability. It seems that fortune envies the great, so it equalizes things by giving long life to the useless, a short one to the important. Those who bear the burden come soon to grief, while those who are of no importance live on and on. 
In one case it appears so, in the other it is so. The unlucky thinks he has been forgotten by both death and fortune. End of section 21section 22 of the art of worldly wisdom this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda sonrisa servision.org the art of worldly wisdom by baltasar gracian translated by joseph jacobs section 22. 191. Do not take payment in politeness, for it is a kind of fraud. Some do not need the herbs of Thessaly for their magic, for they can enchant fools by the grace of their salute. Theirs is the bank of elegance, and they pay with the wind of fine words. To promise everything is to promise nothing. Promises are the pitfalls of fools. The true courtesy is performance of duty. The spurious, and especially the useless, is deceit. It is not respect, but rather a means to power. Obeisance is paid not to the man, but to his means, and compliments are offered not to the qualities that are recognized, but to the advantages that are desired. 192. Peaceful life, a long life. To live, let live. Peacemakers not only live, they rule life. Hear, see, and be silent. A day without dispute brings sleep without dreams. Long life, and a pleasant one, is life enough for two. That is the fruit of peace. He has all that makes nothing of what is nothing to him. There is no greater perversity than to take everything to heart. There is equal folly in troubling our heart about what does not concern us, and in not taking to heart what does. 193. Watch him that begins with another's to end with his own. Watchfulness is the only guard against cunning. Be intent on his intentions. Many succeed in making others do their own affairs, and unless you possess the key to their motives, you may at any moment be forced to take their chestnuts out of the fire to the damage of your own fingers. 194. Have reasonable views of yourself and of your affairs, especially in the beginning of life. Everyone has a high opinion of himself, especially those who have least ground for it. Everyone dreams of his good luck and thinks himself a wonder. Hope gives rise to extravagant promises which experience does not fulfill. Such idle imaginations merely serve as a wellspring of annoyance when disillusion comes with the true reality. The wise man anticipates such errors. He may always hope for the best, but he always expects the worst, so as to receive what comes with equanimity. True, it is wise to aim high so as to hit your mark but not so high that you miss your mission at the very beginning of life. This correction of the ideas is necessary, because before experience comes expectation is sure to soar too high. The best panacea against folly is prudence. If a man knows the true sphere of his activity and position, he can reconcile his ideas with reality. 195 know how to appreciate. There is none who cannot teach somebody something, and there is none so excellent but he is excelled. To know how to make use of every one is useful knowledge. Wise men appreciate all men, for they see the good in each, and know how hard it is to make anything good. Fools depreciate all men, not recognizing the good and selecting the bad. 196. Know your ruling star. None so helpless as not to have one. If he is unlucky, that is because he does not know it. Some stand high in the favor of princes and potentates, without knowing why or wherefore. 
except that good luck itself has granted them favor on easy terms, merely requiring them to aid it with a little exertion. Others find favor with the wise. One man is better received by one nation than by another, or is more welcome in one city than in another. He finds more luck in one office or position than another, and all this though his qualifications are equal or even identical. Luck shuffles the cards how and when she will. Let each man know his luck as well as his talents, for on this depends whether he loses or wins. Follow your guiding star and help it without mistaking any other for it, for that would be to miss the north, though its neighbor, the pole star, calls us to it with a voice of thunder. 197. Do not carry fools on your back. He that does not know a fool when he sees him is one himself. Still more he that knows him but will not keep clear of him. They are dangerous company and ruinous confidants. Even though their own caution and others' care keeps them in bounds for a time, still at length they are sure to do or to say some foolishness, which is all the greater for being kept so long in stock. They cannot help another's credit who have none of their own. They are most unlucky, which is the nemesis of fools, and they have to pay for one thing or the other. There is only one thing which is not so bad about them, and this is that, though they can be of no use to the wise, they can be of much use to them as signposts or as warnings. 198. Know how to transplant yourself. There are nations with whom one must cross their borders to make one's value felt, especially in great posts. Their native land is always a stepmother to great talents. Envy flourishes there on its native soil, and they remember one's small beginnings rather than the greatness one has reached. A needle is appreciated that comes from one end of the world to the other, and a piece of painted glass might outvie the diamond in value if it comes from afar. Everything foreign is respected, partly because it comes from afar, partly because it is ready-made and perfect. We have seen persons once the laughing-stock of their village, and now the wonder of the whole world, honored by their fellow countrymen and by the foreigners among whom they dwell, by the latter because they come from afar, and by the former because they are seen from afar. The statue on the altar is never reverenced by him who knew it as a trunk in the garden. 199. To find a proper place by merit, not by presumption. The true road to respect is through merit, and if industry accompany merit, the path becomes shorter. Integrity alone is not sufficient. Push and insistence is degrading, for things arrive by that means so be sprinkled with dust that the discredit destroys reputation. The true way is the middle one, halfway between deserving a place and pushing oneself into it. 200. Leave something to wish for, so as not to be miserable from very happiness. The body must respire and the soul aspire. If one possessed all, all would be disillusion and discontent. Even in knowledge, there should always be something left to know in order to arouse curiosity and excite hope. Surfeits of happiness are fatal. In giving assistance, it is a piece of policy not to satisfy entirely. If there is nothing left to desire, there is everything to fear, an unhappy state of happiness. When desire dies, fear is born. End of section 22. Section 23 of The Art of Worldly Wisdom. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Sonrisa, Servision.org. The Art of Worldly Wisdom by Baltasar Gracian. Translated by Joseph Jacobs. Section 23. 201. They are all fools who seem so besides half the rest. Folly arose with the world, and if there be any wisdom, it is folly compared with the divine. 
but the greatest fool is he who thinks he is not one and all others are to be wise it is not enough to seem wise least of all to oneself he knows who does not think that he knows and he does not see who does not see that others see though all the world is full of fools there is none that thinks himself one or even suspects the fact 202 words and deeds make the perfect man one should speak well and act honorably the one is an excellence of the head the other of the heart and both arise from nobility of soul words are the shadows of deeds the former are feminine the latter masculine it is more important to be renowned than to convey renown speech is easy action hard actions are the stuff of life words its frippery eminent deeds endure striking words pass away actions are the fruit of thought if this is wise they are effective 203 know the great men of your age they are not many there is one phoenix in the whole world one great general one perfect orator one true philosopher in a century a really illustrious king in several mediocrities are as numerous as they are worthless eminent greatness is rare in every respect since it needs complete perfection and the higher the species the more difficult is the highest rank in it many have claimed the title great like caesar and alexander but in vain for without great deeds the title is a mere breath of air there have been few senecas and fame records but one apelles 204 attempt easy tasks as if they were difficult and difficult as if they were easy in the one case that confidence may not fall asleep in the other that it may not be dismayed for a thing to remain undone nothing more is needed than to think it done on the other hand patient industry overcomes impossibilities great undertakings are not to be brooded over lest their difficulty when seen causes despair 205 know how to play the card of contempt it is a shrewd way of getting things you want by affecting to depreciate them generally they are not to be had when sought for but fall into one's hands when one is not looking for them as all mundane things are but shadows of the things eternal they share with shadows this quality that they flee from him who follows them and follow him that flees from them contempt is besides the most subtle form of revenge it is a fixed rule with the wise never to defend themselves with the pen for such defense always leaves a stain and does more to glorify one's opponent than to punish his offense it is a trick of the worthless to stand forth as opponents of great men so as to win notoriety by a roundabout way which they would never do by the straight road of merit there are many we would not have heard of if their eminent opponents had not taken notice of them there is no revenge like oblivion through which they are buried in the dust of their unworthiness audacious persons hope to make themselves eternally famous by setting fire to one of the wonders of the world and of the ages the art of reproving scandal is to take no notice of it to combat it damages our own case even if credited it causes discredit and is a source of satisfaction to our opponent for this shadow of a stain dulls the luster of our fame even if it cannot altogether deaden it 206 know that there are vulgar natures everywhere even in corinth itself even in the highest families everyone may try the experiment within his own gates but there is also such a thing as vulgar opposition to vulgarity which is worse this special kind shares all the qualities of the common kind just as bits of a broken glass but this kind is still more pernicious it speaks folly blames impertinently is a disciple of ignorance a patron of folly and past master of scandal you need not notice what it says still less what it thinks 
it is important to know vulgarity in order to avoid it, whether it is subjective or objective. For all, folly is vulgarity, and the vulgar consists of fools. 207. Be moderate. One has to consider the chance of a mischance. The impulses of the passions cause prudence to slip, and there is the risk of ruin. A moment of wrath or of pleasure carries you on farther than many hours of calm, and often a short diversion may put a whole life to shame. The cunning of others uses such moments of temptation to search the recesses of the mind. They use thumbscrews as are wont to test the best caution. Moderation serves as a counterplot, especially in sudden emergencies. Much thought is needed to prevent a passion taking the bit in the teeth, and he is doubly wise who is wise on horseback. He who knows the danger may with care pursue his journey. Light as a word may appear to him who throws it out, it may import much to him that hears it and ponders on it. 208. Do not die of the fool's disease. The wise generally die after they have lost their reason. Fools before they have found it. To die of the fool's disease is to die of too much thought. Some die because they think and feel too much. Others live because they do not think and feel. These are fools because they do not die of sorrow. The others because they do. A fool is he that dies of too much knowledge. Thus some die because they are too knowing, others because they are not knowing enough. Yet though many die like fools, few die fools. 209. Keep yourself free from common follies. This is a special stroke of policy. They are of special power because they are general, so that many who would not be led away by any individual folly cannot escape the universal failing. Among these are to be counted the common prejudice that any one is satisfied with his fortune, however great, or unsatisfied with his intellect, however poor it is. Or again, that each, being discontented with his own lot, envies that of others. Or further, that persons of today praise the things of yesterday, and those here the things there. Everything past seems best, and everything distant is more valued. He is as great a fool that laughs at all as he that weeps at all. 210. Know how to play the card of truth. Tis dangerous, yet a good man cannot avoid speaking it. But great skill is needed here. The most expert doctors of the soul pay great attention to the means of sweetening the pill of truth. For when it deals with the destroying of illusion, it is the quintessence of bitterness. A pleasant manner has here an opportunity for a display of skill. With the same truth it can flatter one and fell another to the ground. Matters of today should be treated as if they were long past. For those who can understand, a word is sufficient, and if it does not suffice, it is a case for silence. Princes must not be cured with bitter draughts. It is therefore desirable, in their case, to gild the pill of disillusion. End of section 23section 24 of the art of worldly wisdom this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer visit librivox.org recording by linda sonrisa servision.org the art of worldly wisdom by baltasar gracian translated by joseph Jacobs. 211. In heaven all is bliss, in hell all misery. On earth between the two, both one thing and the other. We stand between the two extremes, and therefore share both. Fate varies. All is not good luck, 
nor all mischance this world is merely zero by itself it is of no value but with heaven in front of it it means much indifference at its ups and downs is prudent nor is there any novelty for the wise our life gets as complicated as a comedy as it goes on but the complications get gradually resolved see that the curtain comes down on a good denouement two hundred and twelve keep to yourself the final touches of your art this is a maxim of the great masters who pride themselves on this subtlety in teaching their pupils one must always remain superior remain master one must teach an art artfully the source of knowledge need not be pointed out no more than that of giving by this means a man preserves the respect and the dependence of others in amusing and teaching you must keep to the rule keep up expectation and advance in perfection to keep a reserve is a great rule for life and for success especially for those in high place 213 know how to contradict a chief means of finding things out to embarrass others without being embarrassed the true thumbscrew it brings the passions into play tepid incredulity acts as an emetic on secrets it is the key to a locked-up breast and with great subtlety makes a double trial of both mind and will a sly depreciation of another's mysterious word scents out the profoundest secrets some sweet bait brings them into the mouth till they fall from the tongue and are caught in the net of astute deceit by reserving your attention the other becomes less attentive and lets his thoughts appear while otherwise his heart were inscrutable an affected doubt is the subtlest picklock that curiosity can use to find out what it wants to know also in learning it is a subtle plan of the pupil to contradict the master who thereupon takes pains to explain the truth more thoroughly and with more force so that a moderate contradiction produces complete instruction two hundred and fourteen do not turn one blunder into two it is quite usual to commit four others in order to remedy one or to excuse one piece of impertinence by still another folly is either related to or identical with the family of lies for in both cases it needs many to support one the worst of a bad case is having to fight it and worse than the ill itself is not being able to conceal it the annuity of one failing serves to support many others a wise man may make one slip but never two and that only in running not while standing still two hundred and fifteen watch him that acts on second thoughts it is a device of business men to put the opponent off his guard before attacking him and thus to conquer by being defeated they dissemble their desire so as to attain it they put themselves second so as to come out first in the final spurt this method rarely fails if it is not noticed let therefore the attention never sleep when the intention is so wide awake and if the other puts himself second so to hide his plan put yourself first to discover it prudence can discern the artifices which such a man uses and notices the pretext he puts forward to gain his ends he aims at one thing to get another then he turns around smartly and fires straight at his target it is well to know what you grant him and at times it is desirable to give him to understand that you understand 216 be expressive this depends not only on the clearness but also the vivacity of your thoughts some have an easy conception but a hard labor for without clearness the children of the mind thoughts and judgments cannot be brought into the world many have a capacity like that of vessels with a large mouth and a small vent others again say more than they think resolution for the will expression for the thought two great gifts plausible minds are applauded yet confused ones are often venerated just because they are not understood and at times obscurity is convenient if you wish to avoid vulgarity 
yet how shall the audience understand one that connects no definite idea with what he says? 217. Neither love nor hate forever. Trust the friends of today as if they will be enemies tomorrow, and that of the worst kind. As this happens in reality, let it happen in your precaution. Do not put weapons in the hand for deserters from friendship to wage war with. On the other hand, leave the door of reconciliation open for enemies, and if it is also the gate of generosity, so much the more safe. The vengeance of long ago is at times the torment of today, and the joy over the ill we have done is turned to grief. 218. Never act from obstinacy, but from knowledge. All obstinacy is an excrescence of the mind, a grandchild of passion which never did anything right. There are persons who make a war out of everything, real banditti of intercourse. All that they undertake must end in victory. They do not know how to get on in peace. Such men are fatal when they rule and govern, for they make government rebellion and enemies out of those whom they ought to regard as children. They try to effect everything with strategy and treat it as the fruit of their skill. But when others have recognized their perverse humor, all revolt against them and learn to overturn their chimerical plans. And they succeed in nothing but only heap up a mass of troubles, since everything serves to increase their disappointment. They have a head turned and a heart spoilt. Nothing can be done with such monsters except to flee from them, even to the Antipodes, where the savagery is easier to bear than their loathsome nature. 219. Do not pass for a hypocrite. Though such men are indispensable nowadays, be considered rather prudent than astute. Sincerity in behavior pleases all, though not all can show it in their own affairs. Sincerity should not degenerate into simplicity, nor sagacity into cunning. Be rather respected as wise than feared as sly. The open-hearted are loved but deceived. The great art consists in disclosing what is thought to be deceit. In the golden age simplicity flourished, in these days of iron cunning, the reputation of being a man who knows what he has to do is honorable and inspires confidence, but to be considered a hypocrite is deceptive and arouses mistrust. 220. If you cannot clothe yourself in lion skin, use fox pelt. To follow the times is to lead them. He that gets what he wants never loses his reputation. Cleverness, when force, will not do. One way or another, the king's highway of valor or the bypath of cunning. Skill has effected more than force, and astuteness has conquered courage more often than the other way. When you cannot get a thing, then is the time to despise it. End of section 24 Section 25. The Art of Worldly Wisdom. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Linda Sonrisa, SirVision.org. The Art of Worldly Wisdom by Baltasar Gracian. Translated by Joseph Jacobs. 221. Do not seize occasions to embarrass yourself or others. There are some men stumbling blocks of good manners, either for themselves or for others. They are always on the point of some stupidity. You meet with them easily and part from them uneasily. A hundred annoyances a day is nothing to them. Their humor always strokes the wrong way since they contradict all and every. They put on the judgment cap wrong side foremost, and thus condemn all. Yet the greatest test of others' patience and prudence are just those who do no good and speak ill of all. There are many monsters in the wide realm of indecorum. 222. Reserve is proof of prudence. The tongue is a wild beast. Once let loose, it is difficult to chain. It is the pulse of the soul. 
by which wise men judge of its health by this pulse a careful observer feels every movement of the heart the worst is that he who should be most reserved is the least the sage saves himself from worries and embarrassments and shows his mastery over himself he goes his way carefully a janus for impartiality an argus for watchfulness truly momus had better placed the eyes in the hand than the window in the breast 223 be not eccentric neither from affectation nor carelessness many have some remarkable and individual quality leading to eccentric actions these are more defects than excellent differences and just as some are known for some special ugliness so these for something repellent in their outward behavior such eccentricities simply serve as trademarks through their atrocious singularity they cause either derision or ill will 224 never take things against the grain no matter how they come everything has a smooth and a seamy side and the best weapon wounds if taken by the blade while the enemy's spear may be our best protection if taken by the staff many things cause pain which would cause pleasure if you regarded their advantages there is a favorable and an unfavorable side to everything the cleverness consists in finding out the favorable the same thing looks quite different in another light look at it therefore on its best side and do not exchange good for evil thus it haps that many find joy many grief in everything this remark is a great protection against the frowns of fortune and a weighty rule of life for all times and all conditions 225 know your chief fault there lives none that has not in himself a counterbalance to his most conspicuous merit if this be nourished by desire it may grow to be a tyrant commence war against it summoning prudence as your ally and the first thing to do is the public manifesto for an evil once known is soon conquered especially when the one afflicted regards it in the same light as the onlookers to be master of oneself one should know oneself if the chief imperfections surrender the rest will come to an end 226 take care to be obliging most talk and act not as they are but as they are obliged to persuade people of ill is easy for any since the ill is easily credited even when at times it is incredible the best we have depends on the opinion of others some are satisfied if they have right on their side but that is not enough for it must be assisted by energy to oblige persons often costs little and helps much with words you may purchase deeds in this great house of the world there is no chamber so hid that it may not be wanted one day in the year and then you would miss it however little is its worth every one speaks of a subject according to his feelings 227 do not be the slave of first impressions some marry the very first account they hear all others must live with them as concubines but as a lie has swift legs the truth with them can find no lodging we should neither satisfy our will with the first object nor our mind with the first proposition for that were superficial many are like new casks who keep the scent of the first liquor they hold be it good or bad if this superficiality becomes known it becomes fatal for then it gives opportunity for cunning mischief the ill-minded hasten to color the mind of the credulous always therefore leave room for a second hearing alexander always kept one ear for the other side wait for the second or even third edition of news to be the slave of your impressions argues want of capacity and is not far from being the slave of your passions 228 do not be a scandalmonger still less pass for one for that means to be considered a slanderer 
Do not be witty at the cost of others. It is easy, but hateful. All men have their revenge on such an one by speaking ill of him, and as they are many and he but one, he is more likely to be overcome than they convinced. Evil should never be our pleasure, and therefore never our theme. The backbiter is always hated, and if now and then one of the great consorts with him, it is less from pleasure in his sneers than from esteem for his insight. He that speaks ill will always hear worse. 229. Plan out your life wisely. Not as chance will have it, but with prudence and foresight. Without amusements it is worrisome, like a long journey where there are no inns. Manifold knowledge gives manifold pleasure. The first day's journey of a noble life should be passed in conversing with the dead. We live to know and to know ourselves. Hence true books make us truly men. The second day should be spent with the living, seeing and noticing all the good in the world. Everything is not to be found in a single country. The Universal Father has divided his gifts, and at times has given the richest dower to the ugliest. The third day is entirely for oneself. The last felicity is to be a philosopher. 230. Open your eyes betimes. Not all that see have their eyes open, nor do all those see that look. To come up to things too late is more worry than help. Some just begin to see when there is nothing more to see. They pull their houses about their ears before they come to themselves. It is difficult to give sense to those who have no power of will, still more difficult to give energy to those who have no sense. Those who surround them play with them a game of blind man's buff, making them the butts of others, and because they are hard of hearing, they do not open their eyes to see. There are often those who encourage such insensibility on which their very existence depends. Unhappy steed whose rider is blind, it will never grow sleek. End of section 25 Section 26 of The Art of Worldly Wisdom. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Sonrisa, SirVision.org. The Art of Worldly Wisdom by Baltasar Gracian. Translated by Joseph Jacobs. Section 26 231 Never let things be seen half-finished. They can only be enjoyed when complete. All beginnings are misshapen, and this deformity sticks in the imagination. The recollection of having seen a thing imperfect disturbs our enjoyment of it when completed. To swallow something great at one gulp may disturb the judgment of the separate parts, but satisfies the taste. Till a thing is everything, it is nothing, and while it is in process of being, it is still nothing. To see the tastiest dishes prepared arouses rather disgust than appetite. Let each great master take care not to let his work be seen in its embryonic stages. They might take this lesson from Dame Nature, who never brings the child to the light till it is fit to be seen. 232 have a touch of the traitor. Life should not be all thought. There should be action as well. Very wise folk are generally easily deceived, for while they know out-of-the-way things, they do not know the ordinary things of life, which are much more needful. The observation of higher things leaves them no time for things close at hand. Since they know not the very first thing they should know, and what everybody knows so well, they are either considered or thought ignorant by the superficial multitude. Let therefore the prudent take care to have something of the traitor about him, enough to prevent him being deceived and so laughed at. Be a man adapted to the daily round, which if not the highest is the most necessary thing in life. Of what use is knowledge if it is not practical, 
and to know how to live is nowadays the true knowledge. 233. Let not the proffered morsel be distasteful. Otherwise it gives more discomfort than pleasure. Some displease when attempting to oblige because they take no account of varieties of taste. What is flattery to one is an offense to another, and in attempting to be useful one may become insulting. It often costs more to displease a man than it would have cost to please him. You thereby lose both gift and thanks because you have lost the compass which steers for pleasure. He who knows not another's taste knows not how to please him. Thus it haps that many insult where they mean to praise and get soundly punished, and rightly so. Others desire to charm by their conversation and only succeed in boring by their loquacity. 234. Never trust your honor to another unless you have his in pledge. Arrange that silence is a mutual advantage, disclosure a danger to both. Where honor is at stake you must act with a partner so that each must be careful of the other's honor for the sake of his own. Never entrust your honor to another. But if you have, let caution surpass prudence. Let the danger be in common and the risk mutual so that your partner cannot turn king's evidence. 235. Know how to ask. With some nothing easier, with others nothing so difficult. For there are men who cannot refuse, with them no skill is required. But with others their first word at all times is no, with them great art is required, and with all the propitious moment. Surprise them when in a pleasant mood, when a repast of body or soul has just left them refreshed, if only their shrewdness has not anticipated the cunning of the applicant. The days of joy are the days of favor, for joy overflows from the inner man into the outward creation. It is no use applying when another has been refused, since the objection to a no has just been overcome. Nor is it a good time after sorrow. To oblige a person beforehand is a sure way, unless he is mean. 236. Make an obligation beforehand of what would have to be a reward afterwards. This is a stroke of subtle policy. To grant favors before they are deserved is a proof of being obliging. Favors thus granted beforehand have two great advantages. The promptness of the gift obliges the recipient the more strongly, and the same gift, which would afterwards be merely a reward, is beforehand an obligation. This is a subtle means of transforming obligations, since that which would have forced the superior to reward is changed into one that obliges the one obliged to satisfy the obligation. But this is only suitable for men who have the feeling of obligation, since with men of lower stamp the honorarium paid beforehand acts rather as a bit than as a spur. 237. Never share the secrets of your superiors. You may think you will share pairs, but you will only share pairings. Many have been ruined by being confidants. They are like sops of bread used as forks. They run the same risk of being eaten up afterwards. It is no favor in a prince to share a secret. It is only a relief. Many break the mirror that reminds them of their ugliness. We do not like seeing those who have seen us as we are. Nor is he seen in a favorable light who has seen us in an unfavorable one. None ought to be too much beholden to us least of all one of the great, unless it be for benefits done him rather than for such favors received from him. Especially dangerous are secrets entrusted to friends. He that communicates his secret to another makes himself that other's slave. With a prince this is an intolerable position which cannot last. He will desire to recover his lost liberty, and to gain it will overturn everything, including right and reason. Accordingly, neither tell secrets nor listen to them. 38. Know what is wanting in yourself. Many would have been great personages if they had not had something wanting without which they could not rise to the height of perfection. It is remarkable with some that they could be much better if they could be better in something. 
they do not perhaps take themselves seriously enough to do justice to their great abilities some are wanting in geniality of disposition a quality which their entourage soon find the want of especially if they are in high office some are without organizing ability others lack moderation in all such cases a careful man may make of a habit a second nature two hundred and thirty nine do not be captious it is much more important to be sensible to know more than is necessary blunts your weapons for fine points generally bend or break common sense truth is the surest it is well to know but not to niggle lengthy comments lead to disputes it is much better to have sound sense which does not wander from the matter in hand 240 make use of folly the wisest play this card at times and there are times when the greatest wisdom lies in seeming not to be wise you need not be unwise but merely affect unwisdom to be wise with fools and foolish with the wise were of little use speak to each in his own language he is no fool who affects folly but he is who suffers from it ingenuous folly rather than the pretended is the true foolishness since cleverness has arrived at such a pitch to be well liked one must dress in the skin of the simplest of animals End of section 26section 27 of the art of worldly wisdom this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer visit librivox.org recording by linda sonrisa survision.org the art of worldly wisdom by baltasar gracian translated by joseph jacobs section 27 241. Put up with raillery, but do not practice it. The first is a form of courtesy, the second may lead to embarrassment. To snarl at play has something of the beast and seems to have more. Audacious raillery is delightful, to stand it proves power. To show oneself annoyed causes the other to be annoyed. Best leave it alone, the surest way not to put on the cap that might fit. The most serious matters have arisen out of jests. Nothing requires more tact and attention. Before you begin to joke, know how far the subject of your joke is able to bear it. 242. Push Advantages Some put all their strength in the commencement and never carry a thing to a conclusion. They invent but never execute. These be paltering spirits. They obtain no fame, for they sustain no game to the end. Everything stops at a single stop. This arises in some from impatience, which is the failing of the Spaniard, as patience is the virtue of the Belgian. The latter bring things to an end, the former come to an end with things. They sweat away till the obstacle is surmounted, but content themselves with surmounting it. They do not know how to push the victory home. They prove that they can, but will not. But this proves always that they cannot, or have no stability. If the undertaking is good, why not finish it? If it is bad, why undertake it? Strike down your quarry, if you are wise. Be not content to flush it. 243. Do not be too much of a dove. Alternate the cunning of the serpent with the candor of the dove. Nothing is easier than to deceive an honest man. He believes in much who lies in naught. Who does no deceit has much confidence. To be deceived is not always due to stupidity. It may arise from sheer goodness. There are two sets of men who can guard themselves from injury, those who have experienced it at their own cost, and those who have observed it at the cost of others. Prudence should use as much suspicion as subtlety uses snares, and none need be so good as to enable others to do him ill. Combine in yourself the dove and the serpent, not as a monster, but as a prodigy. 
244. Create a feeling of obligation. Some transform favors received into favors bestowed, and seem, or let it be thought, that they are doing a favor when receiving one. There are some so astute that they get honor by asking, and by their own advantage with applause from others. They manage matters so cleverly that they seem to be doing others a service when receiving one from them. They transpose the order of obligation with extraordinary skill, or at least render it doubtful who has obliged whom. They buy the best by praising it, and make a flattering honor out of the pleasure they express. They oblige by their courtesy, and thus make men beholden for what they themselves should be beholden. In this way they conjugate to oblige in the active instead of in the passive voice, thereby proving themselves better politicians than grammarians. This is a subtle piece of finesse. A still greater is to perceive it, and to retaliate on such fools' bargains by paying in their own coin, and so coming by your own again. 245. Original and out-of-the-way views are signs of superior ability. We do not think much of a man who never contradicts us. That is no sign he loves us, but rather that he loves himself. Do not be deceived by flattery, and thereby have to pay for it. Rather condemn it. Besides, you may take credit for being censured by some, especially if they are those of whom the good speak ill. On the contrary, it should disturb us if our affairs please every one, for that is a sign that they are of little worth. Perfection is for the few. 246. Never offer satisfaction unless it is demanded. And if they do demand it, it is a kind of crime to give more than necessary. To excuse oneself before there is occasion is to accuse oneself. To draw blood in full health gives the hint to ill will. An excuse unexpected arouses suspicion from its slumbers. Nor need a shrewd person show himself aware of another's suspicion, which is equivalent to seeking out offense. He had best disarm distrust by the integrity of his conduct. 247. Know a little more. Live a little less. Some say the opposite. To be at ease is better than to be at business. Nothing really belongs to us but time, which even he has who has nothing else. It is equally unfortunate to waste your precious life in mechanical tasks or in a profusion of important work. Do not heap up occupation and thereby envy, otherwise you complicate life and exhaust your mind. Some wish to apply the same principle to knowledge, but unless one knows, one does not truly live. 248. Do not go with the last speaker. There are persons who go by the latest edition, and thereby go to irrational extremes. Their feelings and desires are of wax. The last comer stamps them with his seal, and obliterates all previous impressions. These never gain anything, for they lose everything so soon. Everyone dyes them with his own color. They are of no use as confidants. They remain children their whole life. Owing to this instability of feeling and volition, they halt along cripples in will and thought, and totter from one side of the road to the other. 249. Never begin life with what should end it. Many take their amusement at the beginning, putting off anxiety to the end. But the essential should come first, and accessories afterwards, if there is room. Others wish to triumph before they have fought. Others, again, begin with learning things of little consequence, and leave studies that would bring them fame and gain to the end of life. Another is just about to make his fortune when he disappears from the scene. Method is essential for knowledge and for life. 250. When to change the conversation. When they talk scandal. With some all goes contrariwise, their no is yes and their yes no. If they speak ill of a thing, it is the highest praise. For what they want for themselves, they depreciate to others. To praise a thing is not always to speak well of it, 
for some to avoid praising what's good praise what's bad and nothing is good for him for whom nothing is bad end of section 27section 28 of the art of worldly wisdom this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer visit librivox.org recording by linda sonrisa servision.org the art of worldly wisdom translated by joseph jacobs section 28 251 use human means as if there were no divine ones and divine as if there were no human ones a masterly rule it needs no comment 252 neither belong entirely to yourself nor entirely to others both are mean forms of tyranny to desire to be all for oneself is the same as desiring to have all for oneself such persons will not yield a jot or lose a tittle of their comfort they are rarely beholden lean on their own luck and their crutch generally breaks it is convenient at times to belong to others that others may belong to us and he that holds public office is no more nor less than a public slave or let a man give up both birth and burthen as the old woman said to hadrian on the other hand others are all for others which is folly that always flies to extremes in this case in a most unfortunate manner no day no hour is their own but they have so much too much of others that they may be called the slaves of all this applies even to knowledge where a man may know everything for others and nothing for himself a shrewd man knows that others when they seek him do not seek him but their advantage in him and by him 253 do not explain overmuch most men do not esteem what they understand and venerate what they do not see to be valued things should cost dear what is not understood becomes overrated you have to appear wiser and more prudent than he requires with whom you deal if you desire to give him a high opinion of you yet in this there should be moderation and no excess and though with sensible people common sense holds its own with most men a little elaboration is necessary give them no time for blame occupy them with understanding your drift many praise a thing without being able to tell why if asked the reason is that they venerate the unknown as a mystery and praise it because they hear it praised 254 never despise an evil however small for they never come alone they are linked together like pieces of good fortune fortune and misfortune generally go to find their fellows hence all avoid the unlucky and associate with the fortunate even the doves with all their innocence resort to the whitest walls everything fails with the unfortunate himself his words and his luck do not wake misfortune when she sleeps one slip is a little thing yet some fatal loss may follow it till you do not know where it will end for just as no happiness is perfect so no ill luck is complete patience serves with what comes from above prudence with that from below 255 do good a little at a time but often one should never give beyond the possibility of return who gives much does not give but sells nor drain gratitude to the dregs for when the recipient sees all return is impossible he breaks off correspondence with many persons it is not necessary to do more than overburden them with favors to lose them altogether they cannot repay you and so they retire preferring rather to be enemies than perpetual debtors the idol never wishes to see before him the sculptor who shaped him nor does the benefited wish to see his benefactor always before his eyes 
there is a great subtlety in giving what costs little yet is much desired so that it is esteemed the more 256 go armed against discourtesy and against perfidy presumption and all other kinds of folly there is much of it in the world and prudence lies in avoiding a meeting with it arm yourself each day before the mirror of attention with the weapons of defence thus you will beat down the attacks of folly be prepared for the occasion and do not expose your reputation to vulgar contingencies armed with prudence a man cannot be disarmed by impertinence the road of human intercourse is difficult for it is full of ruts which may jolt our credit best to take a byway taking ulysses as a model of shrewdness feigned misunderstanding is of great value in such matters aided by politeness it helps us over all and is often the only way out of difficulties 257 never let matters come to a rupture for our reputation always comes injured out of the encounter every one may be of importance as an enemy if not as a friend few can do us good almost any can do us harm in jove's bosom itself even his eagle never nestles securely from the day he has quarrelled with a beetle hidden foes use the paw of the declared enemy to stir up the fire and meanwhile they lie in ambush for such an occasion friends provoked become the bitterest of enemies they cover their own failings with the faults of others every one speaks as things seem to him and things seem as he wishes them to appear all blame us at the beginning for want of foresight at the end for lack of patience at all times for imprudence if however a breach is inevitable let it rather be excused as a slackening of friendship than by an outburst of wrath here is a good application of the saying about a good retreat 258 find out some one to share your troubles you will never be all alone even in dangers nor bear all the burden of hate some think by their high position to carry off the whole glory of success and have to bear the whole humiliation of defeat in this way they have none to excuse them none to share the blame neither fate nor the mob are so bold against two hence the wise physician if he has failed to cure looks out for some one who under the name of a consultation may help him carry out the corpse share weight and woe for misfortune falls with double force on him that stands alone 259 anticipate injuries and turn them into favors it is wiser to avoid than to revenge them it is an uncommon piece of shrewdness to change a rival into a confidant or transform into guards of honor those who were aiming attacks at us it helps much to know how to oblige for he leaves no time for injuries that fills it up with gratitude that is true savoir faire to turn anxieties into pleasures try and make a confidential relation out of ill will itself 260 we belong to none and none to us entirely neither relationship nor friendship nor the most intimate connection is sufficient to effect this to give one's whole confidence is quite different from giving one's regard the closest intimacy has its exceptions without which the laws of friendship would be broken the friend always keeps one secret to himself and even the son always hides something from his father some things are kept from one that are revealed to another and vice versa in this way one reveals all and conceals all by making a distinction among the persons with whom we are connected end of section 28。section 29 of the art of worldly wisdom this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Cudo. 
The Art of Worldly Wisdom by Balthasar Gracian, translated by Joseph Jacobs, section 29. 261. Do not follow up a folly. Many make an obligation out of a blunder, and because they have entered the wrong path think it proves their strength of character to go on in it. Within they regret their error, while outwardly they excuse it. At the beginning of their mistake they were regarded as inattentive, in the end as fools. Neither an unconsidered promise nor a mistaken resolution are really binding. Yet some continue in their folly and prefer to be constant fools. 262. Be able to forget. It is more a matter of luck than of skill. The things we remember best are those better forgotten. Memory is not only unruly, leaving us in the lurch when most needed, but stupid as well, putting its nose into places where it is not wanted. In painful things it is active, but neglectful in recalling the pleasurable. Very often the only remedy for the ill is to forget it, and all we forget is the remedy. Nevertheless, one should cultivate good habits of memory, for it is capable of making existence a paradise or an inferno. The happy are an exception who enjoy innocently their simple happiness. 263. Many things of taste one should not possess oneself. One enjoys them better if another's than if one's own. The owner has the good of them the first day. For all the rest of the time, they are for others. You take a double enjoyment in other men's property, being without fear of spoiling it and with the pleasure of novelty. Everything tastes better for having been without it. Even water from another's well tastes like nectar. Possession not alone hinders enjoyment. It increases annoyance whether you lend or keep. You gain nothing except keeping things for or from others, and by this means gain more enemies than friends. 264. Have no careless days. Fate loves to play tricks, and will heap up chances to catch us unawares. Our intelligence, prudence, and courage, even our beauty, must always be ready for trial, for their day of careless trust will be that of their discredit. Care always fails just when it is most wanted. It is thoughtlessness that trips us up into destruction. Accordingly, it is a piece of military strategy to put perfection to its trial when unprepared. The days of parade are known and are allowed to pass by, but the day is chosen when least expected so as to put valor to the severest test. 265. Set those under you difficult tasks. Many have proved themselves able at once when they had to deal with a difficulty, just as fear of drowning makes a swimmer of a man. In this way, many have discovered their own courage, knowledge, or tact, which, but for the opportunity, would have been forever buried beneath their want of enterprise. Dangers are the occasions to create a name for oneself, and if a noble mind sees honor at stake, he will do the work of thousands. Queen Isabella the Catholic knew well this rule of life, as well as all the others, and to a shrewd favor of this kind from her, the great captain won his fame, and many others earned an undying name. By this great art she made great men. 266. Do not become bad from sheer goodness. That is, by never getting into a temper. Such men without feeling are scarcely to be considered men. It does not always arise from laziness, but from sheer inability. To feel strongly on occasion is something personal. Birds soon mock at the mocking. It is a sign of good taste to combine bitter and sweet. All sweets is diet for children and fools. It is very bad to sink into such insensibility out of very goodness. 267. Silken words sugared manners. Arrows pierce the body insults the soul sweet pastry perfumes the breath it is a great art in life to know how to sell wind most things are paid for in words and by them you can remove impossibilities thus we deal in air and a royal breath can produce courage and power always have your mouth full of sugar to sweeten your words so that even your ill-wishers enjoy them to please one must be peaceful 268. The wise do at once what the fool does at last. 
both do the same thing. The only difference lies in the time they do it, the one at the right time, the other at the wrong. He catches by the foot what he ought to knock on the head, he turns right into left, and in all his acts is but a child. There is only one way to get him the right way, and that is to force him to do what he might have done of his own accord. The wise man, on the other hand, sees at once what must be done sooner or later, so he does it willingly, and gains honor thereby. 269. Make use of the novelty of your position. For men are valued while they are new. Novelty pleases all because it is uncommon. Taste is refreshed, and a brand new mediocrity is thought more of than accustomed excellence. Ability wears away by use and becomes old. However, know that the glory of novelty is short-lived. After four days, respect is gone. Accordingly, learn to utilize the first fruits of appreciation, and seize during the rapid passage of applause all that can be put to use. For once the heat of novelty over, the passion cools and the appreciation of novelty is exchanged for satiety at the customary. Believe that all has its season, which soon passes. 270. Do not condemn alone that which pleases all. There must be something good in a thing that pleases so many. Even if it cannot be explained, it is certainly enjoyed. Singularity is always hated, and when in the wrong, laughed at. You simply destroy respect for your taste rather than do harm to the object of your blame, and are left alone, you and your bad taste. If you cannot find the good in a thing, hide your incapacity and do not damn it straight away. As a general rule, bad taste springs from want of knowledge. What all say is so or will be so. End of section 29《Section 29 Section 30 of The Art of Worldly Wisdom This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Sonrisa Servision.org The Art of Worldly Wisdom by Baltasar Gracian Translated by Joseph Jacobs Section 30 271 In every occupation, if you know little, stick to the safest. If you are not respected as subtle, you will be regarded as sure. On the other hand, a man well trained can plunge in and act as he pleases. To know little and yet seek danger is nothing else than to seek ruin. In such a case, take stand on the right hand, for what is done cannot be undone. Let little knowledge keep to the king's highway, and in every case, knowing or unknowing, security is shrewder than singularity. 272. Sell things by the tariff of courtesy. You oblige people most that way. The bid of an interested buyer will never equal the return gift of an honorable recipient of a favor. Courtesy does not really make presents, but really lays men under obligation, and generosity is the great obligation. To a right-minded man nothing costs more dear than what is given him. You sell it him twice and for two prices, one for the value, one for the politeness. At the same time, it is true that with vulgar souls generosity is gibberish, for they do not understand the language of good breeding. 273. Comprehend their dispositions with whom you deal, so as to know their intentions. Cause known, effect known, beforehand in the disposition and after in the motive. The melancholy man always foresees misfortunes, the backbiter scandals. Having no conception of the good, evil offers itself to them. A man moved by passion always speaks of things differently from what they are. It is his passion speaks, not his reason. Thus each speaks as his feeling or his humor prompts him, and all far from the truth. Learn how to decipher faces and spell out the soul in the features. If a man laughs always, set him down as foolish. If never, as false. Beware of the gossip. He is either a babbler or a spy. 
expect little good from the misshapen they generally take revenge on nature and do little honor to her as she has done little to them beauty and folly generally go hand in hand two hundred and seventy four be attractive it is the magic of subtle courtesy use the magnet of your pleasant qualities more to obtain good will than good deeds but apply it to all merit is not enough unless supported by grace which is the sole thing that gives general acceptance and the most practical means of rule over others to be in vogue is a matter of luck yet it can be encouraged by skill for art can best take root on a soil favored by nature there goodwill grows and develops into universal favor 275 join in the game as far as decency permits do not always pose and be a bore this is a maxim for gallant bearing you may yield a touch of dignity to gain the general goodwill you may now and then go where most go yet not beyond the bounds of decorum he who makes a fool of himself in public will not be regarded as discreet in private life one may lose more on a day of pleasure than has been gained during a whole life of labor still you must not always keep away to be singular is to condemn all others still less act the prude leave that to its appropriate sex even religious prudery is ridiculous nothing so becomes a man as to be a man a woman may affect a manly bearing as an excellence but not vice versa 276 know how to renew your character with the help both of nature and of art every seven years the disposition changes they say let it be a change for the better and for the nobler in your taste after the first seven comes reason with each succeeding luster let a new excellence be added observe this change so as to aid it and hope also for betterment in others hence it arises that many change their behavior when they change their position or their occupation at times the change is not noticed till it reaches the height of maturity at twenty man is a peacock at thirty a lion at forty a camel at fifty a serpent at sixty a dog at seventy an ape at eighty nothing at all 277 display yourself tis the illumination of talents for each there comes an appropriate moment use it for not every day comes a triumph there are some dashing men who make much show with a little a whole exhibition with much if ability to display them is joined to versatile gifts they are regarded as miraculous there are whole nations given to display the spanish people take the highest rank in this light was the first thing to cause creation to shine forth display fills up much supplies much and gives a second existence to things especially when combined with real excellence heaven that grants perfection provides also the means of display for one without the other were abortive skill is however needed for display even excellence depends on circumstances and is not always opportune ostentation is out of place when it is out of time more than any other quality it should be free of any affectation this is its rock of offence for it then borders on vanity and so on contempt it must be moderate to avoid being vulgar and any excess is despised by the wise at times it consists in a sort of mute eloquence a careless display of excellence for a wise concealment is often the most effective boast since the very withdrawal from view piques curiosity to the highest tis a fine subtlety too not to display one's excellence all at one time but to grant stolen glances at it more and more as time goes on each exploit should be the pledge of a greater and applause at the first should only die away in expectation of its sequel 278 avoid notoriety in all things even excellences become defects if they become notorious notoriety arises from singularity 
which is always blamed. He that is singular is left severely alone. Even beauty is decredited by coxcombry, which offends by the very notice it attracts. Still more does this apply to discreditable singularities. Yet among the wicked there are some that seek to be known for seeking novelties in vice, so as to attain to the fame of infamy. Even in matters of the intellect, want of moderation may degenerate into loquacity. 279. Do not contradict the contradictor. You have to distinguish whether the contradiction comes from cunning or from vulgarity. It is not always obstinacy, but may be artfulness. Notice this, for in the first case one may get into difficulties, in the other into danger. Caution is never more needed than against spies. There is no such countercheck to the picklock of the mind as to leave the key of caution in the lock. 280. Be trustworthy. Honorable dealing is at an end. Trusts are denied. Few keep their word. The greater the service, the poorer the reward. That is the way with all the world nowadays. There are whole nations inclined to false dealing. With some, treachery has always to be feared. With others, breach of promise. With others, deceit. Yet this bad behavior of others should rather be a warning to us than an example. The fear is that the sight of such unworthy behavior should override our integrity. But a man of honor should never forget what he is, because he sees what others are. End of section 30section 31 of the art of worldly wisdom this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer visit librivox.org recording by linda sonrisa servision.org the art of worldly wisdom by baltasar gracian translated by joseph jacobs section 31 281. Find favor with men of sense. The tepid yes of a remarkable man is worth more than all the applause of the vulgar. You cannot make a meal off the smoke of chaff. The wise speak with understanding, and their praise gives permanent satisfaction. The sage Antigonus reduced the theater of his fame to Zeus alone, and Plato called Aristotle his whole school. Some strive to fill their stomach, albeit only with the breath of the mob. Even monarchs have need of authors, and fear their pens more than ugly women the painter's pencil. 282. Make use of absence to make yourself more esteemed or valued. If the accustomed presence diminishes fame, absence augments it. One that is regarded as a lion in his absence may be laughed at when present as the ridiculous result of the parturition of the mountains. Talents get soiled by use, for it is easier to see the exterior rind than the kernel of greatness it encloses. Imagination reaches farther than sight, and disillusion, which ordinarily comes through the ears, also goes out through the ears. He keeps his fame that keeps himself in the center of public opinion. Even the phoenix uses its retirement for new adornment and turns absence into desire. 283. Have the gift of discovery. It is a proof of the highest genius. Yet when was genius without a touch of madness? If discovery be a gift of genius, choice of means is a mark of sound sense. Discovery comes by special grace and very seldom. For many can follow up a thing when found, but to find it first is the gift of the few, and those the first in excellence and in age. Novelty flatters, and if successful, gives the possessor double credit. In matters of judgment, novelties are dangerous because leading to paradox. In matters of genius, they deserve all praise. Yet both equally deserve applause, if successful. 284 do not be importunate. 
and so you will not be slighted respect yourself if you would have others respect you be sooner sparing than lavish with your presence you will thus become desired and so well received never come unasked and only go when sent for if you undertake a thing of your own accord you get all the blame if it fails none of the thanks if it succeeds the importunate is always the butt of blame and because he thrusts himself in without any shame he is thrust out with it two hundred and eighty five never die of another's ill luck notice those who stick in the mud and observe how they call others to their aid so as to console themselves with a companion in misfortune they seek some one to help them to bear misfortune and often those who turned the cold shoulder on them in prosperity give them now a helping hand there is great caution needed in helping the drowning without danger to oneself two hundred and eighty six do not become responsible for all or for every one otherwise you become a slave and the slave of all some are born more fortunate than others they are born to do good as others to receive it freedom is more precious than any gifts for which you may be tempted to give it up lay less stress on making many dependent on you than on keeping yourself independent of any the sole advantage of power is that you can do more good above all do not regard responsibility as a favor for generally it is another's plan to make one dependent on him 287 never act in a passion if you do all is lost you cannot act for yourself if you are not yourself and passion always drives out reason in such cases interpose a prudent go-between who can only be prudent if he keeps cool that is why lookers-on see most of the game because they keep cool as soon as you notice that you are losing your temper beat a wise retreat for no sooner is the blood up than it is spilt and in a few moments occasion may be given for many days repentance for oneself and complaints of the other party two hundred and eighty eight live for the moment our acts and thoughts and all must be determined by circumstances will when you may for time and tide wait for no man do not live by certain fixed rules except those that relate to the cardinal virtues nor let your will subscribe fixed conditions for you may have to drink the water tomorrow which you cast away today there may be some so absurdly paradoxical that they expect all the circumstances of an action should bend to their eccentric whims and not vice versa the wise man knows that the very pole star of prudence lies in steering by the wind two hundred and eighty nine nothing depreciates a man more than to show he is a man like other men the day he is seen to be very human he ceases to be thought divine frivolity is the exact opposite of reputation and as the reserved are held to be more than men so the frivolous are held to be less no failing causes such failure of respect for frivolity is the exact opposite of solid seriousness a man of levity cannot be a man of weight even when he is old and age should oblige him to be prudent although this blemish is so common it is none the less despised two hundred and ninety tis a piece of good fortune to combine man's love and respect generally one dare not be liked if one would be respected love is more sensitive than hate love and honor do not go well together so that one should aim neither to be much feared nor much loved love introduces confidence and the further this advances the more respect recedes prefer to be loved with respect rather than with passion for that is a love suitable for many end of section 31section 32 of the art of worldly wisdom this is a librivox recording 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Linda Sonrisa, Servision.org. The Art of Worldly Wisdom by Baltasar Gracian. Translated by Joseph Jacobs. Section 32. 291. Know How to Test. The care of the wise must guard against the snare of the wicked. Great judgment is needed to test that of another. It is more important to know the characteristics and properties of persons than those of vegetables and minerals. It is indeed one of the shrewdest things in life. You can tell metals by their ring and men by their voice. Words are proof of integrity, deeds still more. Here one requires extraordinary care, deep observation, subtle discernment, and judicious decision. 292. Let your personal qualities surpass those of your office. Let it not be the other way about. However high the post, the person should be higher. An extensive capacity expands and dilates more and more as his office becomes higher. On the other hand, the narrow-minded will easily lose heart and come to grief with diminished responsibilities and reputation. The great Augustus thought more of being a great man than a great prince. Here a lofty mind finds fit place, and well-grounded confidence finds its opportunity. 293. Maturity. It is shown in the costume, still more in the customs. Material weight is the sign of a precious metal, moral of a precious man. Maturity gives finish to his capacity and arouses respect. A composed bearing in a man forms a façade to his soul. It does not consist in the insensibility of fools, as frivolity would have it, but in a calm tone of authority. With men of this kind, sentences are orations and acts are deeds. Maturity finishes a man off, for each is so far a complete man according as he possesses maturity. On ceasing to be a child, a man begins to gain seriousness and authority. 294. Be moderate in your views. Everyone holds views according to his interest and imagines he has abundant grounds for them. For with most men judgment has to give way to inclination. It may occur that two may meet with exactly opposite views, and yet each thinks to have reason on his side. Yet reason is always true to itself and never has two faces. In such a difficulty a prudent man will go to work with care, for his decision of his opponent's view may cast doubt on his own. Place yourself in such a case in the other man's place, and then investigate the reasons for his opinion. You will not then condemn him or justify yourself in such a confusing way. 295. Do not affect which you have not effected. Many claim exploits without the slightest claim. With the greatest coolness they make a mystery of all. Chameleons of applause, they afford others a surfeit of laughter. Vanity is always objectionable. Here it is despicable. These ants of honor go crawling about filching scraps of exploits. The greater your exploits, the less you need to affect them. Content yourself with doing. Leave the talking to others. Give away your deeds, but do not sell them. And do not hire venal pens to write down praises in the mud, to the derision of the knowing ones. Aspire rather to be a hero than merely to appear one. 296. Noble Qualities Noble qualities make noble men. A single one of them is worth more than a multitude of mediocre ones. There was once a man who made all his belongings, even his household utensils, as great as possible. How much more ought a great man see that the qualities of his soul are as great as possible? In God all is eternal and infinite. So in a hero everything should be great and majestic, 
so that all his deeds, nay, all his words, should be pervaded by a transcendent majesty. 297. Always act as if your acts were seen. He must see all round who sees that men see him or will see him. He knows that walls have ears, and that ill deeds rebound back. Even when alone he acts as if the eyes of the whole world were upon him. For as he knows that sooner or later all will be known, so he considers those to be present as witnesses who must afterwards hear of the deed. He that wished the whole world might always see him did not mind that his neighbors could see him over their walls. 298. Three things go to a prodigy. They are the choicest gifts of heaven's prodigality, a fertile genius, a profound intellect, a pleasant and refined taste. To think well is good, to think right is better, tis the understanding of the good. It will not do for the judgment to reside in the backbone, it would be of more trouble than use. To think aright is the fruit of a reasonable nature. At twenty, the will rules. At thirty, the intellect. At forty, the judgment. There are minds that shine in the dark like the eyes of the lynx, and are most clear where there is most darkness. Others are more adapted for the occasion. They always hit on that which suits the emergency. Such a quality produces much and good, a sort of fecund felicity. In the meantime, good taste seasons the whole of life. 299. Leave off hungry. One ought to remove even the bowl of nectar from the lips. Demand is the measure of value. Even with regard to bodily thirst, it is a mark of good taste to slake, but not to quench it. Little and good is twice good. The second time comes a great falling off. Surfeit of pleasure was ever dangerous, and brings down the ill will of the highest powers. The only way to please is to revive the appetite by the hunger that is left. If you must excite desire, better do it by the impatience of want than by the repletion of enjoyment. Happiness earned gives double joy. 300. In one word, be a saint. So it is all said at once. Virtue is the link of all perfections, the center of all the felicities. She it is that makes a man prudent, discreet, sagacious, cautious, wise, courageous, thoughtful, trustworthy, happy, honored, truthful, and a universal hero. Three H's make a man happy, health, holiness, and a headpiece. Virtue is the sun of the microcosm, and has for hemisphere a good conscience. She is so beautiful that she finds favor with both God and man. Nothing is lovable but virtue. Nothing